Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 12th, 12th excuse me, Grafton School Committee meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Grafton School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so by visiting the Zoom link uh, located on the Grafton Town website. We will need to take attendance and announce all the committee members and school officials who are on the call and we'll take a roll call vote for all votes. So I'm going to start with uh, the school committee to take roll call. Laura Often's here. Um, Jennifer Conley. Jennifer Connolly here. Amy Marr. Amy Marr here. Rahul Rati. Rahul Rati here. Elizabeth Spinney. Spinney here. Dr. Cummings. Jay Cummings here. Tracy Kalo. She's having some technical difficulties okay. that she's working through. Okay, yeah, I was like, she was here, we lost her. Uh, Kristen Gasper. Kristen Gasper here. Anita Patel. Here. Joanne Stockland. Joanne Stockland here. Steve Wilshire. Stephen Wilshire here. Annabelle Weber. Here. James Dewar. Here. Mr. Schwab. Paul Schwab here. Mrs. Ms. Lape. Mrs. Lape here. Late. Oh, for goodness sakes. I'm sorry, Mandy. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. Uh, Robin. Hi there. And Nora. Nora Snyder here. Excellent. So everybody's here. Did I miss anybody? All right. And um, as, as it's been for a little while, public comment is currently suspended, but our Q&A is open uh, for questions. And we ask viewers at home to continue the same decorum they would use during an in-person meeting. And we will have Amy Marr, our clerk, monitoring the questions. We'll allow one question and one follow up per person during our meeting, depending on the amount of questions. And we retain the right to ask anyone to leave who is unable to act appropriately. And as always, we invite you to reach out us to us via our school email accounts or on our GPS budget uh, COVID Facebook page. So welcome, happy new year to everybody. And I'm gonna quickly turn this meeting over to, uh, we have Joanne Stockland, um, and Steve with Stephen Wilshire and team, and they're going to present an update from Millbury Street Elementary School and North Street Elementary School. So welcome. I think Mr. Wilshire is gonna share his screen and we'll get going. And we're so glad to have all of you here. All right, so thank you, Laura, for that introduction. And uh, you should everyone should be able to see the screen in, in full here, correct? All right, excellent. Um, so first, just want to thank uh, Laura and the school committee for having us today, and, and also just for your leadership uh, throughout this year. It's been, you know, certainly a year presented with many challenges, but uh, we're so appreciative to have all of you and Dr. Cummings, uh, Tracy Kalo, um, Kristen, who's here, Anita, uh, all the central office team um, helping guide us through that. So just we just wanted to first start off by just sharing our thanks to all of you and. Uh, I know Joanne and I are both excited to present together. Um, and Joanne, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words real quick before I, I, I kind of get into the next few slides. No, I can only just reiterate your thanks to the school committee and central office staff for their fantastic support this year. Uh, it truly is appreciated, um, you know, by myself and Paul, as well as the entire Millbury Street School staff. So thank you. And so we look forward to sharing Paul uh, and, and uh, Mandy are both here and uh, that we couldn't have found two better assistant principals this year. Um, when Joanne and I started looking in the spring, we, you know, obviously given the situation that we were in, uh, we certainly were worried, but we definitely made out uh, <laughs> in finding two fantastic assistants to join us. And we uh, certainly have needed it this year more than any other. And we also have uh, Robin and um, Nora with us. And uh, Robin is our, the school psychologist at Millbury Street School. I'm sure you all know Robin. Uh, Nora is our new adjustment counselor that is splitting her time between North Street and Millbury Street. And we could not be more thankful to have Nora joining our team this year as well. Um, so they're going to be speaking uh, to a little bit about what they've been working on uh, in a little bit. Um, 
I would just start off though by sharing um, a couple of quick words. Uh, we began this year by talking to our staff about flexibility, patience, and appreciation. It, it was our theme of the, of the year. Uh, flexibility, we just knew obviously to start the year, but as the year went on, flexibility was going to be key because it's going to be a changing target. Um, and, it, and it certainly has been, but our staff has done a great job, as you'll see, of making adjustments and really coming together. Um, patience, we, we weren't going to have the answers always in front of us. We weren't going to always know what to do in every moment, but we were going to have patience with each other, patience with our families and students to really work through those changes. Um, and then finally, appreciation. You know, we um, asked our staff to think back to last spring where we were all home and we weren't able to see the kids. So as we began the year and as we continued to move through the year, really appreciating what we are able to do uh, with the kids in front of us, with the kids at home who are learning fully remotely um, and just being together. And I really think, as you'll see, the staff has responded in just ways we couldn't even imagine. This picture that you see there is actually Mrs. Perch in her collection of fully remote learning students. They've uh, been with her all year and each kid designed their own Bitmoji and they're in their own Bitmoji classroom there. Um, it's been fantastic to see the kids and the staff just respond in such a positive way. Uh, and uh, I, I just can't say enough about, about everybody uh, in both communities. Uh, so tonight we're going to walk through just a few things for everybody. And uh, by the way, I would add that Joanne and I are thrilled to be doing this together. Um, Joanne and I have always worked closely together, but I think this year more than any other, it's really uh, been um, uh, a silver lining, the collaboration that we've been able to have together and talking about how we you know, move forward throughout this year. So uh, we're gonna hear about the learning models that we have students engage in. Uh, we're gonna look at some positives of celebrating 2020 and not just uh, moving beyond it because there are many positives that have come out of this. Um, we can't, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about our amazing staff and the students that have really just stepped up and shown tremendous amount of resolve and perseverance. Uh, and then also uh, Nora and Robin are gonna speak to our social emotional programming this year, which has been critical, obviously, getting our kids back into the building and for those kids at home um, who uh, still need that, that level of support that we wanna provide them with. So we look forward to sharing those pieces and taking some questions at the end of our presentation. And uh, I think next up was uh, Paul was gonna share a little bit about our, our learning styles, right? That's right, thanks Steve. So um, the, obviously the 2021 year presented a lot of challenges for us, um, but as Steve mentioned, it presented a lot of opportunities too. So again, we'll be highlighting some of that during our presentation. Um, if we go into the next slide, uh, our real core mission for the year was to try and ensure that our students were getting a uh, really high quality uh, academic program to ensure that those academic and social emotional needs were met for them. So when we initially got together to start planning the year, we wanted to focus uh, on four areas, um, curriculum planning, motivation, management, and instructional strategies. So we began looking at how we could find ways to build in uh, additional planning time for our teachers. We knew that the demands of the school year were going to be unlike anything we had ever uh, we'd ever done. Uh, so we were successfully able to find uh, time during the week where teachers to get, could get together to plan and collaborate across the different platforms that we had going on from our remote to our full in-person to, and to hybrid. Um, in addition to that, we had a number of PD opportunities for our teachers uh, both over the summer and that have continued into the school year to give them an opportunity uh, really in addition to the collaboration piece also a chance to get more proficient uh, in technology and teaching remotely, which, you know, as we understand has, um, I think the rollout has gone quite well, uh, but there have been some growing pains with it. I would think that we're in a really good spot right now though. Um, additionally, the schedules and protocols that we were putting together uh, took quite a bit of work. Uh, at first, this was really, really challenging work. Um, Steve, Mandy, myself, and Joanne really worked hand in hand to ensure that our programming was uh, very similar. Uh, in fact, we share a number of students between the two schools in our remote learning academy. So we really had to be in sync for that to happen. Uh, over time, I think things 
became much easier and have become kind of second nature to us. Uh, our staff has been nothing short of terrific in helping to make sure just a laundry list of protocols were put into place so that we could stay in school safely. Um, I come to school feeling really good about it every day. I feel really safe in school and it's really thanks in, um, to the work that they've done. So we do have three programs going on, our full in-person, our hybrid, and our full remote. Um, as you can see, we've listed the percentages of how many students are in each. Um, at first, we started uh, a bit lower on this full in-person. Our hybrid and full remote numbers were uh, a little bit higher, but as time went on, we did see begin to see a trickle into hybrid and full in-person um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, as we saw that there were students who may have some additional needs that needed to come back full in person, we worked really closely with our families and with our teachers uh, to ensure that was happening. Um, lately, as things have spiked a bit, uh, we've gone a bit back and forth with some folks opting to go back to remote uh, and some folks um, still choosing to come into hybrid. Uh, overall, I think the hybrid model has worked really, really well. Um, we have a unique hybrid program in the week on week off, and I'm very pleased that we ended up deciding to go with that. We've gotten a lot of great feedback from families uh, and it seems to be working quite well. The next thing we wanted to do was talk about how wonderful our staff has been. They are the true heroes of the school year. Um, Steve started off by talking about flexibility, patience, and appreciation. And we, we have seen all of that tenfold with, with our teachers this year. Um, you know, one thing that has been a key element that we've tracked pretty seriously is um, teacher attendance. And we're proud to say that overall it has been, um, you know, overwhelmingly increased this year, um, which, which is helpful as you can imagine. And I think that you probably all know um, the staffing concerns have been uh, the utmost uh, forefront of our day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, when teachers are out on quarantine and things like that uh, with limited sub coverage, it does present with um, some daily scheduling issues. Um, the four of us have been able to get into some classrooms probably more than uh, an, an average year would allow, which we really enjoy. But, um, you know, aside from those issues, the teachers really have um, shown us their their commitment to the children's learning this year and it, it really um, it's been inspiring to see um, they they continue to be remarkably flexible they have new cleaning protocols new schedules uh, we've essentially revamped the entire schedule um, everything that they've ever done is is completely new to them and they face it with a remarkable amount of positivity every day. Um, I myself consider, I, I consider myself blessed to, to be working in such a wonderful environment full of positivity. And, and the collaboration piece is really probably the most important. We've got remote learning academy teachers who are collaborating with special educators. We've got in-person teachers collaborating with the hybrid remote teachers and they're sharing materials and they're making sure that our students who are transitioning to and from the building each week are doing so seamlessly and they're communicating with each other, they're communicating with uh, the children's families. And it's it's a remarkable showmanship, a show of team, team building, sorry. And it's really just, it's remarkably impressive to see. And we're very, very proud of, of everything that our staff has done this year. So I'm gonna move in to talk a little bit about the importance of the core values that we have um, established and we live at, uh, through at Millbury Street and North Street School. Um, as you know, core values are really what anchors the whole school community together. Not only are they practice within a classroom, but uh, throughout the school building. And I think that's what um, 
I think makes the cultures of the students and the staff and even our parents at Millbury Street and North Street so strong is that we all do believe in our core values and we live and breathe them every day. So I'm gonna share a little bit of the about the core values at Millbury Street and Steve will follow with the core values at North Street. Our core values uh, at Millbury Street spell the acronym CARES, which is um, directly from responsive classroom curriculum. You might also notice that those um, five uh, core values of cooperation, assertion, responsibility, empathy, and self-control are also um, on the elementary student's report card under the social and emotional habits of mind. So um, at Millbury Street, we've been celebrating um, our practice and implementation of care throughout the building with our care certificate. So you see two pictures of two students um, who are being presented and recognized with a care certificate. And how our care certificate program works is that a staff member can nominate a student or a student may nominate another student who has uh, gone above and beyond the um, the regular decorum that we expect at Millbury Street School and has truly um, demonstrated one of our core values and they nominate the child. Uh, we receive the nomination form. We actually do track which core value or values they can be nominated and recognized for two so that we can make sure as a staff that we aren't overemphasizing one core value over the other. Um, and Mr. Schwab and I will actually go visit as a surprise the classroom of the recipient. We like to, the kids get very excited when we come into the room. They're all anxious when they see those green cards and they want to know whose turn it is. And we announce um, who the recipient is and the child will come up. And we spend a few minutes talking to the children about the core value that was recognized. Um, and how fortunate that we are that we have not only a classmate who demonstrates these core values, but also we are part of a school community that values the trait of cooperation, assertion, responsibility, empathy, and self-control. And we really do talk to the children about how we are all nice to each other, but we're really looking for that little thing that takes it just above and beyond being nice. And so some of the examples that children have done to receive one of these care certificates, um, perhaps um, in responsibility and empathy, they may uh, get the homework collected for a student who's absent that day that lives near them or has a bus stop near them and take the responsibility of gathering it and bringing it by their house after school. It's sometimes not even being asked, but just checking with the teacher for their friend. Or a student may um, show some cooperation and responsibility by staying after in the art room, not being asked, but just to help Mrs. Tucker clean up for the next class. Um, so those are the kind of things that we want to recognize the children for. Sitting on the buddy bench with a child who at recess looking for a friend. A little bit of empathy there. So we like visiting the classrooms. We like talking in the grassroots effort about why core values are important. And, um, and the kids really love, love the program. And um, we've been doing it for 10 years now, and it's been really effective. Um, so that's how we celebrate our core values of CARES at Millbury Street. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, we, we do the same at North Street. Our core values uh, spell out the acronym STARS. And uh, we kind of use that to call ourselves the North, the North Street STARS or the North STARS. We lead the way. Uh, we really encourage kids to be leaders in their community. And similar to what Joanne shared, we, we celebrate it in a, in a similar way uh, to that. And I think I, instead of reiterating all those points, um, you know, I think what we also have spent a lot of time both at Millbury Street and North Street over the last, I would say, five years or so has really focused on the, the whole push of growth mindset and perseverance in children, um, self-awareness, um, power of yet. Uh, and we have really used that opportunity the, this year to talk to the kids about how important those skills are. And I think I would like to believe that our efforts in that area leading up to this pandemic and the success our kids are having has been in large part because we have spent so much time in our SEL curriculum talking to the kids about those important um, traits to have, not just in, as a child in school, but as an adult in life um, to always be kind of persevering when things are not going well. 
Um, we do talk to our kids about how easy it is to show these core values when things are going well and things are great and easy for you and, every, and you have adults watching you. Uh, but really, it's what you should be doing when no one's watching you. Uh, these should be things that intrinsically you want to have to have be successful as you get older and your service to others, being on a team and being a team player, setting goals for yourself and achieving them, taking responsibility for your roles and then you know, knowing how your, your actions and your words impact those around you as we start talking about equity and inclusiveness. So um, to see the kids actually exhibit these is, is a kind of a proud teacher moment um, because we've even heard kids say like, well, we just have to persevere through this. And, and it means that they're really getting a hold of it. And uh, another thing Joanne and I just have gone back and forth with to make sure we're sharing and including those things uh, in a similar way for, for all the kids in 2-6 in Grafton. And back to Mandy, I believe. Yes. So, so one thing that we really wanted to highlight during our presentation today was the fact that through all of the struggles and all of the unknowns, um, especially over the summer that we were planning for and we were adapting our our schedule and talking about how we were going to make sure that every protocol was being followed. Um, you know, as the school year got started, we really did see a lot of positives come out of everything that's been happening. And, and we think that it's definitely worth sharing with all of you. Um, so, you know, on the screen, you can see a few of the things that we came up with. We've certainly heard a lot this evening about the collegiality and the empathy shown by not only our staff, but our students as well, and, and kind of celebrating them for, for being as um, resilient of, as they've really been. I know a lot of the conversations we had over the summer were about the social stories that we were going to develop to help them understand the importance of wearing masks and things like that. And we haven't had to use any of it because the students have just adapted to their new normal and um, and they really have shown that with a little bit of grit and a little bit of perseverance, um, they can learn kind of in this new normal and these um, kind of strange circumstances that they've never been in before, but but they're making it happen and we're making it happen and we're, we're very proud of that. Um, you know, another thing that's come out of this is, um, you know, certain changes that we've made for um, routines, for example, we've got, you know, at least at North Street, we've got new drop off procedures, new pickup procedures, um, and it's, it's pretty much smooth sailing. Um, transportation has been going very well. We've seen students taking ownership of these new routines. Uh, they, they know when they need to sanitize their hands and, and how to properly socially distance themselves um, even when they're outside at recess. And it really is showing um, how, how resilient our children are. Uh, another change that we really um, love to celebrate this year is our related arts schedule. So uh, over the summer, we decided it would be important to kind of change the way related arts have worked in the past, um, where, where students would see each teacher or each class each week um, for the purpose of kind of limiting the exposure of our teachers, but also kind of just keeping the schedule in line for cleaning purposes and such. Uh, we have our, our students are in actually a, a cycle now with related arts. So they see the same related art teacher, for example, art each weekday for a cycle of a number of weeks. And I was actually having a conversation with our art teacher just yesterday about how much more she's able to do with her students, how much deeper into her curriculum and her project she's able to get with her students because she sees them every single day. Um, and she's, a, a, you know, the, the nature of how she's using her materials allows for a lot more choice and a lot more creativity with her students than she's ever had before. So it's definitely worth pointing out that even though uh, maybe the reasons behind the schedule change were for safety protocol purposes, we've, we've seen some really great things come out of that as well. And then, um, you know, we've talked a lot about technology. Obviously, the fact that we're doing this virtually is, is um, different than anything we've ever seen before. But 
technology and communication has really gone above and beyond pretty much anything we really expected to see. Um, you'll see on our next slide some of the different ways that we have de uh, developed our communication with the community, with the families and things like that. Our sixth graders received Chromebooks for the first time this year. They're the, in the one-to-one the one -one model and they're using Schoology whether they're in person or remote or hybrid, um, they, they have these devices and the teachers are really able to finally move from kind of substituting the curriculum with technology to really redefining it in a way that they never were able to, to use it before. And I, I know that Paul mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the PD opportunities that our teachers had um, the how they're using technology is, is not only creative, but it's really redefining the way that the students are able to access the curriculum this year. And if we take a look at the next slide, so these are just some, some fun images of, of the different ways that the four of us have been reaching out to the community. We've got our websites and we've got our Facebook pages. We also uh, had some fun earlier in the year developing our very own Bitmoji offices, if you will. Um, and there are some fun links in there. Um, and I know that our related arts, uh, sorry, our uh, Remote Learning Academy students are um, using that to kind of explore some different options that we have out there too. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin and to Nora. And I'm just going to start real quick to introduce oh, them. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. So we are going to um, conclude with the fourth and final segment of our presentation tonight, which um, focuses on social emotional programming. Um, so a little backdrop. Um, we've been very fortunate um, in the past years to be the recipients of the Target Grant for Education. And in the past, we've targeted balanced literacy programs. We have targeted um, instructional um, integration in the instruction, uh, purchased equipment for coding in the computer lab. And so this year, applying for the grant, it seemed most appropriate to um, focus the funding on supporting our students' emotional um, and social well-being during the pandemic. So we were fortunate enough to receive the grant. And I approached uh, Robin A.B., the Millbury Street School psychologist, and our fantabulous new school adjustment counselor that we share between North Street and Millbury Street and thought, how perfect to ask them to develop programming with this grant money, um, which they were very happy to do. Uh, and they are going to present now um, how they're implementing the uh, grant monies awarded. Okay. I'm going first. And so thank you so much for inviting us. And Nora and I are so delighted to be able to use this target money for some emotional regulation skills and coping skills for our students. Um, first and foremost, our teachers have done a phenomenal job of really making those necessary relationships and connections with students. And that has um, reduced the need for us to be involved. So kudos to all of them and all of the wonderful things we've been doing that the principals have mentioned has also helped for sure. Um, in terms of the students that even still are still having some difficulty, some of whom have already been on our caseloads and some students have um, you know, we've added to our caseloads because of, you know, COVID's been a very stressful time. There may have been some losses. There may have been other stressors going on at home or even just the, uh, the struggles with hybrid learning, as we all know. So um, one strategy that we wanted to utilize was the zones of regulation. And it's, a, it's an incredible system where it's a color-coded uh, emotional regulation system that's really engaging for students. You know, um, between the color coding and being able to implement and show them different clips of videos uh, from different movies, they really, they really grasp it. So it, what it entails is these different colors as you see at the bottom of the page. So there's a blue zone, green, yellow, and red zones, and they all um, cluster not only emotions, but your energy level. So if you notice the blue zone is identified for it when you're feeling sad, sick, tired, bored, or moving slowly. 
So I hear a lot of that on Monday mornings for my sixth grade students. <laughs> um, the green zone is kind of where we want to, you know, to aim for if you're not in there. But if you are in there, that's great because that's when you're happy, you're calm, you're feeling okay, you're focused and you're ready to learn. Um, and that's, that's key. So, and it's okay to be in the other zones. We just wanna to try to make the efforts to get back into the green zone. And then the yellow zone, you could be frustrated, worried, a little silly or wiggly, excited, or you might have a little loss of control in some way. Um, and then there's the red zone. And that's when you're you know, more intensely mad or angry or terrified, yelling, hitting, elated, out of control. Um, and so the first order of business is for them to be able to identify which zone they're in and, and the, the corresponding emotion. Then the second goal is to help them identify what are those triggers to those emotions? So we can kind of figure out what's, what's precipitating these emotions. And then lastly, and, and more importantly, we help them to build a zones toolbox. And that's the other example I have here on the slide. And this is a toolbox that um, I helped uh, in a fifth grade group that I have. And what they do is we go through and we brainstorm and we practice different coping strategies for each zone that they're in. And the green zone is different because these are strategies that you want to use to stay in that zone. But the other ones are trying to help you get towards that or back into that green zone. Um, the kids have loved it. They, you know, my sixth graders are grasping it really well. The, the younger grades need a lot more, um, you know, teaching and examples, but we have a lot of fun doing it. And it's something that they can take with them. We make copies, they can take it home with them. And so they can use it in home, at home or at school. And now we're gonna talk uh, about the yoga for classrooms with Nora. Great, thank you so much, Robin. Um, so as Joanne and Robin both mentioned, we were fortunate enough to be awarded the Target grant this year. And in addition to the zones of regulation curriculum, we were also able to purchase a really great curriculum called Yoga for Classrooms. And Yoga for Classrooms is especially useful this year because they provide physical materials for us to use in the classroom, but also electronic copies. Uh, so we're able to support our remote learners as well. Great. So these three images that you will see right here include different categories for the activities that are provided on the activity cards for Yoga for Classroom. So these are different activities that students can do in the classroom, uh, you know, at their desk or while they're standing up and taking a little movement break. Um, these are also activities that they can do in the home when they're outside of school, whether it's during academic time or during leisure time. So the different categories are around mindfulness breathing. Uh, you'll see three different categories there at your desk, standing strong and loosen up, which include different activities that students can do throughout their day uh, just to help self-regulate. There's a category titled imagination vacation, which helps students with guided visualization as well as the final category titled Be Well. And that category specific focuses specifically on uh, just healthy way of living, healthy eating, getting a good night's rest, drinking lots of water and things like that. And finally, one of the things that we really wanna, wanted to start focusing on as we move throughout the school year is making sure that our students who are fully remote in the Remote Learning Academy are getting all of the social emotional support that they need while they're learning at home. So at both Millbury Street and North Street, we were able to send surveys out to families just, just to check in and see how families are doing, see how their learners are doing um, and get some great suggestions from them. So some feedback that we received from families is that over 90% of our families report that they're either doing well with remote learning or that they're struggling a bit, but doing okay. 4.6% of our families feel that they are struggling or need support. 40% of our families report that they are satisfied with their child's current level of interaction. However, 40% of families wish that their child would reach out to other students or peers more often via phone, internet, video chats, etc. And so Robin is gonna take a few moments just to talk a little bit about 
some of the things that we will be implementing moving forward based on this great data and feedback that we received from our families. All right, so based on the responses and some great feedback with the open-ended questions for parents to answer to, um, we came up with some ideas. Some were directly from parents and others we just kind of gleaned like, gee, this might help address that concern. So one of them, uh, a couple of parents had noted, gee, you know, is there any way for the district to revamp their clubs and after-school activities to be remote? Good question. Um, I think that's something we should look into as a district. Um, the other uh, suggestion um, that I thought of, because some of the parents were like, I would just like to be able to talk to someone. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to go about doing this with my child or, or I'm a little stressed or um, things like that. So maybe having a drop in Google Meet for specifically the RLA parents. You know, not, not only are the students a bit more isolated, but so are the parents. So, you know, that might be helpful to have, you know, for them to come to a Google Meet once or twice a month to just kind of touch base with myself or Nora and other parents and kind of see what topics come up from them. And then also uh, there were, there was one or two parents that noted that one of their teachers, their child's teachers is doing a recess chat twice a week. And they, the child loves it. And so I think that's fabulous. And maybe we can get in on that too um, and maybe suggest it to other teachers um, who may not have thought of that. I think just having that open-ended kind of fun um, social time, I think might help them feel less isolated. And then a couple of parents said, gee, I would really love to know who else is in Remote Learning Academy so we can connect with them outside of school. Um, so maybe we can think of some ideas on how they can do that um, for those who are willing to share their contact information. And then the next page um, are just some quotes from some of the parents that led us to these, um, these suggestions. So, you know, one parent said maybe after school hours for a Google Meet just to socialize um, and maybe even interest driven groups like Legos, books, video games, things like that. Um, another parent again said remote clubs or other social offerings. Another parent said, more time for video recess like Ms. Bowen is currently doing. I believe Mrs. Fontaine is also doing that, I heard. Um, small group meetings with friends virtually. But again, I think some of them need those contact information um, if it's outside of school time. Um, ways to help parent cope given the circumstances we are all in. And there, that comes the, um, maybe that once or twice a month, a, a parent drop in. Um, more after school programs, that's, that keeps happening. I keep hearing that. Um, my daughter started the, Recess chats twice, two days a week, and that seems to help a lot. Um, another parent suggested engaging online games. So um, again, trying to get them to connect with each other outside of school um, would be ideal. So that's about it for us. And we thank you so much for letting us uh, show us what we're doing. That was amazing. Thank you, everybody. I will open it up to the committee for questions. Steve, can I ask you to stop sharing? I um, will. Yep. I hate it. If somebody wants to refer to a slide, I hate to not have it, but. Sure, yeah. Always... Yep. I can always pull it back up if needed. Perfect. It's just a lot easier to see people, especially with yeah. this large group. Yep. Um, anybody have any questions? I see Liz's hand first. And I'm going to refer straight to a slide, but it's. <laughs> question and just was I just I this question might be for Mr. Wiltshire the pick with the um staff members in the beanie baby costumes was that from North Street oh oh I, it I, sure is it <laughs> is yes uh I want that for the yearbook save that send that oh, right. we can do that yes yes <laughs> that was our fourth grade team for Halloween this year great um Thank you. Uh, what great presentations tonight. And thank you so much for coming a little earlier in the year than you're used to coming, I think, um, to present this information to us. Um, my first question is for, I think, Nora and Robin. I was just wondering, regarding the, the um, information that you're providing to students, is that, do you go into the classrooms if, so that all the students are getting the benefit of your services, or is this more of a targeted is your work more of a, a, a targeted um, service where kids are kind of pulled out who, who might need to hear what you have to say or, or speak with you? How does, how that's, does a great, that's a great question. 
As of right now, um, we're doing it in both an individual and a smaller group format, but we are certainly open to, um, you know, allowing teachers to get involved with it and, and we'd be happy to present with the classroom or have the teacher involved in any way they would like to be to, to share it amongst everyone because certainly emotional regulation skills um, are helpful to every single one of us. So um, yeah, that's something that I would love to see happen. So it, it certainly would be a goal. And, and just to add to that too, Nora, we're just talking, we were talking about that just the other day. I think it was yesterday, Nora. Um, last year, right before we had closed down, Beth Hubbard, our school psychologist at North Street, who's on maternity leave right now, we're talking about how we could have staff meetings around the zones of regulation and offering that as a maybe a PLC so that the teachers are aware of the language, but then they can really actually own a little bit more of it. We so didn't like, want to overwhelm the, the not the parents, the, we didn't want to overwhelm the teachers right off the bat, given that all the changes that were going on, but hopefully the dust has settled, settled a bit. So maybe, you know, this latter half of the year might be a nice time to try and um, see who might be interested in that. And we also did discuss um, creating um, some video series, maybe, you know, a video in each one of the zones and that way we can distribute that and share it um, with all the classrooms and the remote teachers um, to, um, to get the exposure to the kids. And a follow-up question, have you noticed just in general, I know all kids are different, but have you noticed a, a higher level of anxiety among students this year? Definitely. Some students that I've ne I never would have probably had to interact with, um, you know, have come to the table here at school and you know struggling with anxiety that really wasn't there before. Um, when I when I kind of take a little bit of a history, so yeah, for sure. And if there is existing anxiety, it's a, a little bit amplified, I'd say. Wouldn't you say, Nora? Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? Rahul? You're on mute, Rahul. There we go. There we go. Okay, uh, my first question, so that we can continue with Liz's uh, question about with Robin and um, Nora, yeah. Uh, I think Principal Stockton already answered part of it. Have you thought of going, uh, doing that with RLA students live, not with the videos, but live at some point? We are already doing that with some identified groups. Okay. Um, with grades two through six, not every, it, it's select students who are struggling. Um, but again, it's, it's something that we would love to be able to share with, you know, the greater school um, general population. Okay. Uh, second question to the two principals here, uh, especially with the RLA kids, have you come across any problems in relation to the submitting of homeworks or the way they are coping with uh, the homeworks after school thing? Yeah, I can speak to that first. I think I think the um, the the remote learning academy students. It's been a, a kind of a, a tale of two stories, if you will. There are some kids who are just really blossoming and really have since March in the Remote Learning Academy. And I think a lot of them, uh, I would say the majority of them are. Um, and then, uh, and I think that's the large part as well from the teachers that are, are leading those remote learning academies. I, I can't say enough about the work that they've done. Um, they, they should be getting the double the pay. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think Joanne and I have also talked about there are kids that have really struggled as well. Um, and, you know, the teachers have done a nice job reaching out. Joanne and I have reached out. We've used Nora and Robin as well. And at the parents that we are reaching out to are, are working with us. They, they recognize the challenge for those students. That, but at this time, they're still, you know, have some concerns about uh, being exposed in, in the children's health, of course. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not been an easy uh, challenge to overcome. Um, obviously, we'd love to have them in the building, but at the same time, we just we know that there are certain obstacles. One thing that 
uh, some of the challenges that we initially had, the technical challenges, the Wi-Fi issues, a lot of those now have been resolved. The tech team has really done a nice job of getting devices into the hands of students, helping families with Wi-Fi if needed, um, even just helping walk through some of the apps like Schoology and uh, Google Classroom and all the different you know pieces that we have in place. Um, but I don't know, Joanne, anything else you want to add to that? I just want to add too. I mean, uh, you know, everything Steve said uh, resonates at Millbury Street School. But what's been truly impressive, and we talk about grit, um, is the grit of these teachers. They do not give up on these students. They are constantly reaching out. Our paraprofessionals that are supporting in the Remote Learning Academy are spending extra time, even you know, spending you know a morning with a child just to make sure that they understand how to log in and how do they get the assignment up and how do they work on it. Um, has really truly been impressive in the collaboration and the connectivity among staff and looking to each other for resources and ideas and how best to support the child and who else can do this has just been completely outstanding. And I, I couldn't be more proud of um, how our teachers are really trying to, you know, support every family, you know, particularly those that are struggling in that remote learning academy who really need that outreach um, as the parents mentioned in the survey that we sent, um, has been truly amazing and impressive. Thank you. Amy, I think I saw your hand. Uh, I just had a question. Thank you all for coming tonight and giving this great presentation before I ask my question. Um, I had asked the principals of North and South Grafton Elementary this too. Um, we had parent-teacher conferences before the break and it was really different. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to hear everyone's take on how that went for your schools, what the turnout was like, what the feedback was like. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, so um, we thought that um, it was, it far exceeded our expectations to how the parent conferences were going to go. Um, and, you know, a lot of feedback from the staff um, and the parents, they, they thought it was great. They um, thought that there was a lot of flexibility when they could schedule it. Uh, it was a time saver. Some of them didn't have to leave work to participate in a conference. They were able to do it. Um, we really had a hard time thinking of um, some deep cons to it, but one of them was, you know, we're humans and we do need that personal contact with people. And we do like to be in the presence of each other. And you do get a, a feel for somebody and a comfortability when you meet with them in person. Uh, some parents aren't able to come to curriculum night. So parent conference night might be the first time or day that they meet the teacher in person. But um, overall, um, I thought it, um, we didn't have, we had very limited no-shows, I think, because there wasn't anything uh, standing in the way of a parent to connect with the teacher except a click of a computer as long as you're in front of it. So uh, it certainly is something I think that uh, I would recommend that we discuss it as a district. Do we offer, you know, a choice maybe for remote or in person or how we do it, but we found it to be far more successful than we had originally anticipated because it was new, it was something different. I, I would uh, I would agree with that. Uh, we were very pleasantly surprised. The, the percentage of uh, parent conferences we had was uh, equal if not higher. And then one thing some teachers even mentioned that there were um, more conferences where both parents attended and uh, you could tell that they were doing it from work. And I think a, a lot of times one parent goes, the other can't because they can't get the you know the time off, or they it's too much of a commute. They work in Boston, or you know, whatever the case might be. So I think our staff also reflected we really liked it, and maybe um, is worth considering you know having an option next time where we have part of the day be remote and part of the day be in person to give families options. Because I do think there is something to be said about that that personal and face to face as well when we are able to do it again. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm glad I'm glad that you guys are open minded about it, because I think it's tempting to go back to the way things were when this is all over. Right. But I think it's so important to see what what and you're already doing. What have we learned through this whole pandemic that we can carry forward? Um, and I think we've learned a lot about how to teach better, how to learn better, how to support our kids better. Um, and you guys, from what I can see, you guys are doing a fantastic job. So thank you. Chad. So that kind of leads up to my question is, first of all, I liked all of your quotes that you had in each of the slides. So thank you for those, they were great quotes. Um, but they, what are things that you think you would like to see carry forward, such as uh, like things that you learned this year? I kind of think I like the idea when you talked about 
redefining how we use technology and we really had to in order for this year to succeed. So I think that's been like very um, helpful and teachers just really had to take on this whole new, I don't know, everything about it was just new to them, but they, I think everyone took it. But is there anything that you would like to seek and to carry on or maybe do more development of so that we can continue with it next year? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll go, want, me, want to go, Jed, do you want me to go? No, I had to go first last time, so you can go first this oh. time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's an exciting question. Um, I could go on for another whole hour, but I, I won't. Um, but um, I, I think, though, the one the, there's so many pieces. We mentioned a lot of those silver linings, but I think one thing that we've seen that uh, we've talked a lot about in the past is is the in the purpose of homework and, and what that looks like and what that entails. And uh, in education, we've been talking about flipped classrooms for, I, I feel like, a decade. Uh -huh. and, and now you finally see it. So like, I think the, I would like to see one, just if I could focus on one thing right now, I'd like to be, be more open-ended conversation around homework. And I know we've had that in recent years, but now even more so because I think the homework that we traditionally have had is it, we can do it in a different way now because our kids know how to access things differently. And the, the, one of the roadblocks was always, well, elementary kids don't know the technology or they're not sure how to do this or that. They know how to do that now, but I think more importantly, the teachers know how to do that now. Um, so I, I think it's a really good opportunity to really in change our instruction um, with technology, not just replacing something with technology, but really enhancing it now. Because I think that's that's the key piece is you know, when you use technology to replace something, you really wanted to enhance what you were doing, not just to replace it. So Joanne. Well, I was that, that's a perfect segue to what um, I was going to highlight was the um, the amount of technology and applications and um, vehicles to communicate to students has been phenomenal that the staff has learned this year just at the initially it was survival we'll admit that but then it became you know they grew comfortable with it and then they actually wanted to explore better ways to reach children and to teach them um, and we're on a roll so we're not going to stop this role we don't want to give up all the gains we've made this year and um, we're just you know started the evaluation system and the goals that teachers are writing they, they've not only focused on the collaboration that they had to do this year to make it successful between the hybrid and the remote um, models, but they are also collaborating on um, how do I look at a lesson and I can teach it in person, but what do I need to do to be able to teach it remotely? And they all have that mindset now, which is phenomenal. And that we're gonna look at how we're using technology as Steve said, it's just not to supplant something, but how do we make it more sophisticated and how do we use it to truly be um, a vehicle to change instruction and how we change how kids have access to learning. So we're really excited about that and moving into next year staying focused on that instructionally. Even if we're all back in person, doesn't mean that that has to stop. Thank you, I appreciate both those answers. And thanks for coming tonight, everyone. Liz? So that sort of leads into my question too. So what do you need? And in particular, I'm looking for ways that the school committee might be able to help you um, continue to be successful for the rest of this year and, and going into next year. Anything? You're all set. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, I, I think you know you you heard from Robin and Nora, and I, I, you know I just want to emphasize those of you who maybe weren't on the committee um, in the last few years, but Joanne and I have really um, you know spoke a lot about the the importance of having a school adjustment counselor at the two to six levels. Uh, Beth Hubbard and Robin are awesome that what their school that what they do, but we have we have large schools and a lot of kids that need support. And, um, you know, the, Nora's position has just been a, a huge for us. So um, if Nora is is one thing I would ask for. Um, and you know, another Nora, but uh, the other piece is just the technology. You know, one of the one of the challenges I guess we've had, and and I I, I hear that that it's coming. The you know the the Chromebooks are coming, um, but our believe it or not, our in person students don't have those devices yet. So um, you know we have a, we've loaned them all out to the kids. They need mm -hmm. them at home. Um, but there's some things in the classroom that we'd love to change while the kids are here as well and are continue doing. Um, so as we look to do that, the one-to-one -one program in sixth grade has been um, really uh, instrumental. I don't know how we would have done sixth grade without having one-to-one -one devices. So I think we need to you know, continue that as well. Joanne? 
I just would mimic that as well. Yeah. And I do think that the supports, um, you know, when we do get to welcome all the students back into the building, uh, there will be students coming to us um, that we haven't really connected with over the course of the last year, and they may be in a different state than when they left us. So I really do want to emphasize um, the importance of, of adding Nora to our staff and the support she can provide the students uh, and not only the staff. It's It's been vital this year and, and extremely um, important. This was our sneaky way to get Nora introduced to school committees so we could promote her and how important she's been this year. Thank you. Well, that, that kind of leads into my question and actually Steve, you answered it, which was we fought pretty hard to get Nora um, as well on our end and we're very pleased. Um, but we had a lot of discussions knowing that one, Nora was definitely not going to be enough. Um, I'm so grateful we have you, especially this year. Um, so it, it is nice to see how impactful you've been and how hopefully we can get another one of you <laughs> um, in the future. Steve, you said something though that I wasn't aware of and shame on me. So there isn't, so there's no tech Chromebooks in the elementary school for the in-person students. So they're not being used in, in the classroom this year for people below sixth grade? Correct, right. Uh, the devices okay. that we've had have been loaned out to the kids to use in the remote learning academy. Um, but I know the tech team is working on getting those replenished, which we're excited about and uh, okay. uh, should be here coming soon, Neil shared. Yeah, th those have already been purchased. It's just a matter of the entire country, if not <laughs> many parts of the world are doing the same thing. So everybody's waiting for those Chromeback, Chromebooks to come in and replace. Gotcha. And I know it's been, you know, we've had to be able to, I'm grateful that we've been able to loan them out to the people that needed them at home for sure. Um, so thank you. Um, so sorry, those are my quick questions, but I had a little bit um, also. I love having you both come together to do this presentation. I don't know how you felt about it and the rest of the committee, but we always kind of, say that our schools work closely together. And I think this is such a great way to showcase it. Um, and I'd love to think about it for future presentations, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. But it's just, it's great to see how close you've all worked together and what a team you are uh, across the district. So thank you for that. Uh, you started off with appreciation to all of us, but I can't say enough how much appreciation I have for all of you. Um, and most of you are Several of you are new or returning back to the school district this year, and um, what a year to start. Seems like you've really jumped in and, and just made such an impact um, with our students. And you do, you see the most amount of students, and it's such an important uh, level. And so I, I just can't say enough for all of you, and of course the teachers uh, and the staff um, this year. So please pass that on to them for the and then Steve, something you said too really resonated me, thinking about the SEL prep that we've been doing for years um, and how in a lot of times people sometimes didn't understand why it mattered. And it kind of takes sometimes a big event like a pandemic to show how important it is to prepare, not just for those small mishaps, but for things that are big. And I'm, I'm glad to see that our, our kids are rising to the channel challenge. Of course, they need support. And of course, they're showing more anxiety. And these are things we're going to have to tackle this year and next year and, and work together to best meet their needs. Um, but I'm grateful for that. So with the grants that we got, are they just, it was seems like it was to purchase the curriculum. So are we going to be able to continue the work next year? Or was it just a one year thing? No, no, uh, the grant, um, what they, the, the grant was about $1,900. And so they were able to purchase, you know, materials for use in both schools. It's ours. We own it. We, we own, we bought the, you know, the, Robin and Nora will be trained yoga for classroom teachers. Uh, so uh, it doesn't stop after this year. It just awesome. builds upon itself. That's great. Um, and I do believe that's all my questions, I think. <laughs> um, did anybody else think of any while I was rattling off? Rahul. Uh, it's not a question. It's uh, uh, the design you, uh, whoever came up with the design of the presentation, they did a very nice job. I don't know who it was, but uh, it was Mandy, very soothing to look Mandy, at. Mandy, raise your hand, Mandy. She did an amazing job. Awesome. She always does. 
Paul is a great Thank you. job doer too, but Mandy got this one. Oh, stop. <laughs> you should have a side job of uh, slide um, presentation designer. <laughs> And I hear she's amazing with a cricket machine too. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> nice. Liz. Um, I was just wondering about outdoor time and the kids. Um, you know, I know in school things are very organized with the kids and they're very safe. When kids are either in the remote learning academy or on their remote weeks, um, how much are they, to what extent are they encouraged to go out, to make that outdoor time, to go outside for a, I don't know, a solo recess or, um, you know, to get outside. I, I know during PE, the, the teachers have programs for them and things, but as far as just that unstructured time to get outdoors and move around, is there um, an effort to, to try to get them to do that even when they're spending most of their day on the on the computer yeah i think that's you know it, it's challenging we've built in um you know similar to the mass breaks at school which are when they can be they are outside um we have those built-in screen breaks they're called in the remote weeks so i'm sure you're familiar with those and i know our teachers have encouraged kids to be outside I, i've heard from parents that it, it's really hit or miss that um, during those screen breaks, some kids are off playing video games and getting more screen time. Um, and I think that's that's one of those challenges that you know we've found as well because we do believe that being outside is so important. That's why we're outside when it's 20 degrees out and freezing because um, that fresh air, that chance to stretch your legs and run around is, is so vital. Um, and I should note too, just this past week, um, the tech team installed the outdoor uh, Wi-Fi setups for us so that once the weather does start getting nicer in the spring, we'll be able to take kids outside with their devices and be able to access uh, our outdoor classroom spaces, the tent spaces, uh, which is going to be uh, fantastic. I think that's something, that's another thing, even as we look forward beyond this, uh, it could be another benefit is that we're going to find you don't have to be within the walls of your classroom to learn and be outside and, you know, and enjoy that stuff there. Joanne? I was just going to add too that they do have a built-in recess, a lunch and a recess to emphasize that, you know, it is a time to get out and to be physical and do something. Some of our teachers are clever in the remote learning academy. They may ask the children to go out and do something outside as part of an assignment or go look for something or observe something, you know, and bring it back in. So um, I think it's, you know, it's encouraged. I know when I make my visits with the students in the Learning Academy, I do ask them, you know, are you part of my, how are you? Are you getting outside? Are you getting some outside time playing and stuff? Um, I think, too, that's just part of that, you know, daily conversation with kids and encouraging them to get out and about. Um, some of it could even be a, a familiar preference, you know, the parents may prefer them to stay inside. So we encourage, we do the best we can to encourage. Thank you. I just wanted to chime in that I think it's important to be mindful that not all kids can go outside during the day. I was that. You know, some of the kids, the parents are working or they're at the YMCA or something and they can't just get up and go. Um, that's something that I, I heard from a couple of parents when a teacher at a different building assigned something and they were like, my kid can't just go outside and build a snowman. Like we can't do that. So I think, yeah, going outside is, is important. Um, we have to figure out ways we can do it that it fits with family schedules. Maybe that's maybe that's a different problem for a different day. It, it's so hard too with this time of year. I feel like they get up and go to school, and the sun has already it, it's set. You know, they're home for an hour and it's gone. Um, so that's that's really tough. This I hope it gets a little bit better, but I definitely hear the importance of going outside. Me, I just take stuff away from my kids. You know, I don't care if they read a book for an hour, just not look at a screen. Um, so if there are any parents listening, I, I hear you, I feel you, but you know, just take the stuff, lock it up for an hour. No, that's a good point, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I had one more thought when we were talking about the RLA survey, which is great that you did that. It might be a good opportunity to utilize some parent volunteers for some of those after school activities. If they know if their kids enjoy gaming online or that a family that likes the escape room, maybe that's an opportunity for that parent to um, run with it. 
Yeah. I can, I, I do want to, um, we are doing some after school remote activities. For instance, um, just today at Millbury Street School, Tufts Veterinarian School did their DAP Junction program uh, remotely this year. So I have a group of sixth graders meeting with them now Tuesdays after school. Um, some students from Grafton High School that are part of the DECA um, club are doing a financial literacy program uh, for students in four to six at Millbury Street School after school. Um, volunteering for that. And um, we're doing Math Olympiad as we have every year, but we're doing it remotely. So, so we also have a remote coding club running yeah, after we school. Yeah, that's well. and we're, yeah. we're doing that as well for each grade. So we, we are, you know, doing those things, maybe not to the amount that we um, are able to in the past, but um, we're doing our best we can to find those moments and capitalize on them. That sounds amazing. Starting at North Street soon? Yeah, boy, great. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Just thank you to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you're welcome to stay, but you are also welcome to be with your families and get some rest. But um, thank you for everything. The presentation was excellent and we appreciate all that you're doing. Um, always and especially this year. So, and anytime you want to return, I'm, we're happy to have you back. So thank you. Thank, thank you everybody. Thank, thank you for having us. Good night. Thanks, so much. Thanks everyone. All right. Excellent. And we're going to turn it over to Jay Cummings for a district update. All right, so it's going to touch on uh, five central things and obviously as normal feel free to interrupt me or ask questions at the end. Um, we're going to talk about COVID, just give a, a general update, talk about athletics, MCAS, staffing and planning. Uh, in terms of COVID, I wanted to, I, I think, I, I hope I've consistently thanked the nursing staff, but our nursing staff has been absolutely fantastic. I can't tell you how much time and effort they put in over the weekends, over the, the holiday break, at night, um, doing like contact tracing. It's super labor intensive. Um, and they, they have just knocked it out of the park and done exceptionally well. Uh, leadership of that group has come from Jackie Davis, who was our nursing coordinator. Uh, this year. I met with her online today with Kristen. Uh, we're in constant contact with her and uh, her leadership has been just fantastic. So I just wanted to thank them. In terms of status, um, obviously we don't have much to compare <laughs> status to, um, but uh, we're, we're doing okay. Um, so far, at least knock on wood, the, the post spike or post holiday break spike um, numbers have gone up, but some people were expecting, you know, 10 plus cases every day and that even growing. Um, today we had one, we had a few yesterday, just about every day we've had cases. Um, and we've been diligently reporting those out. I get a lot of complaints, not a lot, I get some complaints. Why do you keep sending us these letters, um, being alarmist or what have you? We actually have to send out the letters. Um, so it's not a, a, a great joy. Uh, to send those out, but it's mandated. We're in the process of rolling out that by next now testing. That's testing. You may recall that we applied uh, to be a part of this initiative a, a few months ago. Um, our nurses have been trained. We actually have all the equipment on site. Uh, we've done all of the, the paperwork uh, that's with it. So we're just about ready to, to roll that out. And what we'll be able to do is with parent permission, um, if somebody is symptomatic, we'll be able to pr provide on-site that testing uh, to see if they're positive or negative and then um, take action as needed based on that. Um, right now we're, we're working through the, probably tomorrow we'll have it sorted out, but figuring out what the most effective way to get that uh, parental consent is going to be, and most likely we're going to do it online. Um, the tech department has work, worked with Jackie Davis today and tomorrow to uh, finalize that. A few weeks ago, I don't remember if it preceded our last meeting, but the CDC and then the Mass DPH reduced the quarantine requirements. 
which helped us greatly down from 14 days, generally down to seven days. And I wanted to talk about vaccinations. That's another thing that I get emailed uh, constantly about. Before you is just a, a, a visual of the, the three main phases. So we're in that phase one now. Um, you may have online or on the news seen fire police, um, EMS workers getting their shots, uh, home-based health care workers, um, long-term facilities, uh, anybody working in those um, areas are in that phase one. Once that wraps up between February and April will be phase two. And in that phase are all the K-12 workers. So that will be anybody from our, our teachers, anybody that's paid by the Grafton Public Schools is going to be under that umbrella. Um, I do expect, I don't know for sure, but I do expect that that will most likely, the vaccinations will be uh, provided out of our schools, uh, probably our gymnasiums, probably after school into the evening. Um, so we're a ways away from figuring all that out that hasn't been even presented to us yet. Um, but obviously we're hoping for February, but it could, that window that's been provided is February to April. Um, in terms of the MCAS, there was a DESE memo that went out, um, it was probably two weeks ago. And th there are still a number of unknowns in terms of MCAS this spring. One of those unknowns is the, the um, new president coming in. And with the new president, um, he has selected a new secretary of education um, at the national level. Uh, we don't know he, the, the new secretary and his staff will obviously make decisions for the next four years about the direction of statewide and federal testing initiatives. Um, the belief is, and this is completely non-binding based on uh, his position in Connecticut, that they will uh, go forward with some version of MCAS this year and into the future. Uh, most likely there's gonna be a reduction in terms of scope and length of the testing. And right now the expectation as it stands today is that all of the testing would be completed at school. So that's obviously gonna include the students in hybrid as well as those students who are in the remote learning academy. I don't know how it would work. We don't know when it would, we don't know any of the details or if it will come to fruition. But as it stands now, uh, in terms of the information that's been shared, uh, we do expect all testing to be completed at school. And then finally, um, basically the mantra when, when the state is speaking about MCAS this year is that it's to be used as a diagnostic tool for districts to get a sense of um, what the needs are in, re in all the different areas, but especially in reading and math, grade levels, individuals, et cetera. Uh, that's basically how it's being framed. In terms of staffing, we've been looking pretty good uh, recently, actually. Um, I think you're well aware that the federal funding that we were worried about, remember it was supposed to end at the end of December, and then in theory, if it did end in the end at the end of December, all of our COVID-related hires in terms of personnel, we wouldn't have a way to pay them. We'd have to go into revolving accounts or it, it would have been incredibly challenging. Uh, we were ready to take it on, but it would have been um, a tremendous financial burden on us. That funding was extended through the remainder of the year. That's fantastic. Uh, we've had a number of staff who were on maternity leave. They've come back, which is always fantastic. Uh, we've had a reduction in close contact numbers. We had um, a small spike at the high school with a couple people that had a lot of close contacts, but generally we've been doing them just so much better than we were a month, month and a half ago. Um, I think people are really cognizant of what it takes to qualify as a close contact, what are the distances, what's that time frame, and are acting out in a daily manner in a way that generally prohibits um, the possibility of having close contacts, which is fantastic. Uh, we've also benefited through or from um, college students who have 
come back and many schools have extended their winter break through mid-February. So temporarily we're in really good shape in terms of substitutes. Um, this is much, much better than what we were seeing uh, you know, two or three months ago for sure. So staffing right now, knock on wood, is looking pretty good. In terms of planning, I think we've done as a district a really exceptional job in terms of planning uh, in trying to, to look ahead and plan for various ways that different things could play out. Um, right now, the biggest thing on the horizon for us is what I expect to be a real challenge. And that's gonna be at some point in the coming months, I'm thinking early spring, even March, we're bound to see, or I would expect to see an increased desire for people to return in person. So the vaccine is somewhere, in, you know, obviously it's rolling out at that point. We're getting better weather. People are kind of you know, going outside. Hopefully we're seeing a decrease in cases. Those three things I think are gonna be the central drivers to have people who might be in RLA to want to return to full time. Even those in hybrid, while we, they can't just demand it and switch, we're, gonna say, we're certainly gonna feel the pressure to have more people go back to the schools. My concern and what I think is gonna be the challenge is I would fully expect that we're gonna have a gap between our very real desire to have more students back in school with those defined limitations in terms of space requirements that are currently imposed. So even if we wanted to, when we've said this, it feels like a million times, even if we wanted to have everybody back, we certainly could not do that because of the three feet minimum and the requirements on the bus um, or on the buses. Um, so the challenge for us is to hope that that gap is not substantial but be able to be as ready as we can possibly be as early as we possibly can be to have students be ready and staff be ready to shift back. Uh, it, it's very complex. It's along the lines of the complexity, not, not to the same degree exactly, but it, it's up there with the challenges that we faced in the summer. Um, so much of our physical space, the storage of furniture, how we've moved things around, how we operate in terms of lunches, uh, certainly on the buses, um, to make that shift and make it seem somewhat seamless to students and to staff is going to take a lot of work. And so that's something that we've been already starting to work on, but it, it's fraught with variables. Um, so that was planning. I think that's all I have in terms of the update and I can take any questions you have on the update. Jen? Um, I, I was just wondering if you were able to have the, take the opportunity to look more into that pool testing that the governor was discussing. Yeah, um, I don't have, I want to be clear, I don't have a definitive yes or no yet on it, but yes, um, we, to answer your question, yes, we've looked into it. Obviously, the a memo came out about pool testing, which is the, the newest state initiative, if you will, uh, around testing, uh, came out, uh, maybe it was Friday, and today they had a webinar for superintendents, uh, directors of nursing, that type of thing to to provide, I think it was about an hour and a half of a provision of all the information on that initiative. Um, I attended that, I attended it virtually with uh, Jackie Davis, who was our nursing coordinator. Um, the two things that jump out as negatives, right now, if I had to answer today, I would say I would not recommend that we move forward with it at this time. Um, the, the two things that jump out are um, the staffing that's required. You need to have a coordinator of testing for that program. You need to have people focused only on um, doing the actual testing, even things like everyday driving, picking up all of the tests from whichever schools are being tested and delivering them to the testing sites. All of that takes time and it takes money with our existing staffing 
as I probably mentioned, I think I, I hope I mentioned earlier, they are absolutely killing it, but they are they are straight out working with what's before us, never mind on a weekly basis testing every student. Um, the second big issue um, with the pool testing is cost. They haven't defined exactly what the cost would be, but the rough estimate that I did using the information was it would be between, they basically cover the first six weeks, which is great. Like the state pays for six weeks and then it's entirely on the district. So those, once we get through six weeks, depending on when we start, we'd have around 11 or 12 weeks till the end of the school year. Um, it would be on a weekly basis, conservatively 15,000 to 25,000 a week. Um, when you add that up, and putting, put in even conservative staffing, we were looking at 165,000 to 300,000 total dollars. The state is quick to say, well-intentioned, say use COVID monies for it. We are, we are using every COVID cent we have going forward to pay for the staff who I spoke about that we've hired for this year now to get them through the second half of the year. Um, if we thought for one second that we'd have extra monies being dedicated to COVID, I would at least consider this more, um, consider it more than I am given the, the costs. Uh, we would have to cut staff to do pool testing. Um, the districts that have done it already, uh, for the most part, have been, I think, districts that are definitely hybrid with not many students, if not all remote, with few students going back, and they've been more urban districts. Um, the ones that presented today about the success that they've had uh, only had a few cases that were actually identified. I forget the percentage, but it was very low. And they were also able, one of the one of the cities partnered with the actual city and all of their staffing to make this work. So they didn't really have to hire many additional staff. And the other partnered with, with uh, Tufts Medical. I don't know if, it, I think it was Medford actually, that, that partnered with Tufts University and their staffing that was in their city. Um, we don't have that. So it's still early. I did talk to Jackie Davis afterwards to get a sense of what she thought. Um, we are both um, leaning towards not pursuing it at this time, um, but that's, I'm giving you a very long, very in-depth in story, but, but those, are, uh, those are the challenges and where my thinking is right now. Thank you very much. I think that's a great answer, Jay. I'm glad to have all that because I know we're going to be asked. We've already been asked. So yeah, I wrote it all down so I don't forget the reasons and, and I'll, I'll definitely put a, put a memo together, uh, okay. at least to get in at the ground floor, you have to put in by Friday that you want in. I don't see, with so many unknowns and not having money, I don't, I don't see us, I don't see myself um, recommending that at, at this point, but I'll give you a full memo. Thanks. I'm sorry, I jumped in. Um, who, who wanted to go next? Rahul. Hey, uh, I have a question not related to your presentation, but in general, the the positive cases that uh, we have seen in the past, have we followed up with them? Like, were there any severe cases at all, students or staff? Were there any what cases? Severe, severe, like oh, hospitalization uh, and all. So far, knock on wood, no. Uh, oh. So far, um, the great majority have not had symptoms. Um, in those who who have um, it's been like a bad cold or the flu type of thing, okay. um, but the great majority have not been symptomatic. Oh, wonderful! Want me to keep on going? Or? No, I have a question, but I, I'm sorry, I lost. It's hard with the screen sharing. Liz, you can go next, and then. I have a question. Okay. Um, 
I know, I'm pretty sure, you, I know you've answered this before, but we've had a lot of, I've seen a lot of questions in the social media about this. So for the people who are watching and who might watch a recording late, later, can you explain how close contact is determined? Yeah, um, in, in a very general sense, that's that contact tracing is done in partnership with the Department of Public Health and our nursing staff. Um, the basic criteria is what they'll do is look back to what um, they go back a, a number of days and look for any instance of a, a person who has tested positive for COVID that they have been within six feet of another individual for a total of 15 minutes. By definition, it's sustained 15 minutes, which I always took as you know, you and I are within six feet of each other for a 15 minute chunk of time. Um, the way it's basically played out is 15 minutes over any part of that school day. So if you and I were together eating lunch, which we shouldn't be within six feet of each other, but let's say we're four feet apart uh, for 10 minutes, we had lunch. And then two hours later, we got together and sat too close to each other within six feet for another five minutes. If I was COVID positive, you would be identified as a close contact. Thank you. Jay, I have a question about the MCAS um, and I might've misunderstood so that last, as of now testing to be completed at school, what does that mean for RLA and do we know yet? Yep, as of now, they are, all as it stands today, RLA students would have to go to school. Is that for a whole school day? Is that in the afternoon? We don't we don't know what those parameters are. But wow. right now, and that could definitely change. Um, but right now, the idea isn't that they're going to create a paper and pencil test that we're all familiar with, and have an online version. Uh, my guess is they just don't have the the capacity or ability to do that with relatively short notice is, is my assumption. Okay. Um, I, I have many, many thoughts on this, but I don't know if now is the time. Um, well, I, but, I, I would only caught, not just caution you, but I'd caution yeah. anybody about giving it, you know, letting it take up too much of your sleep because it, it's so up in the air right now. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's very speculative. I understand that. No, and I'm thinking, I mean, there are districts that are completely 100% remote, I mean, not Grafton. Yeah. And I guess I would always say you can opt out too, but we'll talk more, I guess. Yeah. I, I appreciate you saying not to lose any sleep. I don't I don't think I sleep anymore, so I'll just yeah, add it to, to my I, list. I know you're not going to, but I just don't want people to think, oh my gosh, I've got to go to school and make up. Yeah, I can see this definitely causing a lot oh, of concern no, and worry no. uh, from parents. Liz, do you and then, want to jump in? Well, yeah, to add to this, and again, I'm not going to lose sleep over this either. So thank you, Dr. Cummings. But the, the I, I think the elementary schools, they take the MCAS via books, right? So the fact that at North Street, they loan them all out, I don't know if that's going to, right. if, if that then prevents them from being able to, to do that. So anyway, maybe we... Yeah, it could be. It could be that they go back to paper and pencil entirely. I mean, many districts, I mean, we're in great... I think our tech department, I want to be real clear, has just knocked it out of the park. But everybody's waiting now again on the newest order of, of um, Chromebooks. Yep. So whatever... Everybody's facing the same thing. So the, the state's definitely going to be keenly aware of that. We don't have the devices to all, everybody sent them out and very few districts have enough, unless they were one-to-one -one already, they just don't have extras in the school. They just don't. Yeah, I, I just, I have a lot of, again, like just in general education purpose wise, um, I was glad that they sent the re reduction in the amount of testing, uh, but I, I have some more concerns. And I know Amy has a question too. Amy, you were on my second screen, so I apologize that I didn't get to you. But um, okay. 
Um, well, I wanted to I wanted to say something about MCAS, and then I have an unrelated question. Um, they've changed they've changed what they've said. This is like the third new memo that's come out. Yeah. So, and I've got a class of twenty twenty two kid. I I know other people do as well. Um, so I'm only worried about her and the graduation requirement at this point. What I wanted to say was that um, for people who are concerned that we're not, you know, if we don't end up doing MCAS, it's not like we don't know where the kids stand. Like. Our teachers are constantly evaluating both math and reading. No, it, there, there's nobody that's falling through a crack if we don't do MCAS. And I think that's kind of the struggle that a lot of districts don't do that. They're not, MCAS is what they use. And maybe there'll be some way that districts can just opt out. Who knows? Yeah. That would be awesome. But I, I will lose sleep over other things before I lose sleep over that. So the one thing I wanted to ask about um, back to the vaccinations. One question that I had, Jay, was you said school staff would be phase two. That's so right. our school nurses cannot get vaccinated now. Is that true? No. Um, uh, great question. The <laughs> if they wanted to, I'm not saying we're gonna. I don't want they, people. To our our school nurses were were actually vaccinated this past Friday. Oh, excellent. Where uh, neighboring districts. Uh, basically reached out and had extra um, vaccine available. Um, two nurses made it, it through the Aspen Valley Collaborative, a number of districts jumped on it. We were able to jump on it. All of our nurses were vaccinated. Uh, that lucky incident or opportunity aside, um, there was some talk about the nurses being added now to the end of phase one. Um, if we didn't have that opportunity, they'd either be at the end of phase one or at the very front of phase two in other districts. Great, thank you. That's great news. Yeah. Anybody else? Annabelle, James? Okay. All right, well, thank you, Jay. That was really helpful. Pleasure. And I would expect in the next couple of weeks, they're going to come out with another MCAS. There's a tremendous amount of, everybody wants to know what's going on with MCAS. There's so much planning, et cetera. Uh, obviously, yeah. the school committee uh, and publicly as soon as we get that. Okay. I'm just um, so got that funding. I was, that's what was keep, I'm sure it was keeping oh, you. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I was really nervous about it. I knew it would happen, but. Yep. Um, I hoped it would. Good to see. Should I keep going, Laura? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Unless people have... Oh, sorry. Does anybody have anything else to say? Okay. Yes, terms, keep going. In terms of the ABC collaborative, that's uh, we simply have to, on a quarterly basis, report uh, about the collaboratives. We belong to two, Aspen Valley Collaborative in Southern Worcester County. ABC provided the two documents that I shared with you. They had a successful audit. And I shared that report and we received a small reimbursement, a couple thousand dollars um, from the collaborative. That's a reimbursement of extra monies uh, from last year. Our number, we, don't, we only received a small amount um, because we only had a few students access ABC last year in their program. Any questions about ABC? They're, they've been doing great. Um, all right. I'm, uh, Still up, right? Okay. Um, in terms of the energy conservation measure uh, projects that we've been talking about through the fall, I wanted to provide an update. Uh, as you know, we've been consistently partnering with Train. They're the ones that we contracted with. They came and did the full audit in late summer, early fall. Um, we presented to school committee a few times uh, in terms of where we were with uh, the potential to move forward with train and get some projects, some capital projects completed. We met with CIPC at least once, if not twice. Um, after the last presentation, um, we requested from train that they include the North Street Elementary School HVAC. So all of the other schools were getting with the exception of the high school because it didn't need to be replaced, but new HVAC systems at the 
four other schools, but they hadn't included North Street. So obviously we wanted to include them. We did so. Uh, the project went up a couple million dollars up to uh, just over $9 million. Um, the that the, the size of that that project, given where we stand financially, just as a town with everything going on, uh, to myself and Anita, that just seemed like too much to take on at at this point. Going to to the town and asking a year after an override for um, a bond of nine million dollars for great projects and projects that needed to be done, not nice to haves. Um, just seemed like too much. So with that, Anita and I decided to make a new recommendation to school committee. Um, I've attached that memo, put it in the shared drive folder uh, that's publicly accessible. In, in terms of that new recommendation for consideration, we wanted to focus on addressing our greatest facility need. Uh, and that is the heating and ventilation system at Grafton Middle School. I feel like I've talked about this for like 10 years. Um, I, I think I really have, where um, we have a new boiler system at the middle school. The problem isn't the, the boiler in that, the core, if you will. The problem is getting the heat in the ventilation generated from that core out into the building. Um, so that's a, a 50 year old building. And the way it's set up is we've got 11 big units. It's almost like Volkswagen bugs. Um, up on the, the roof, uh, tied into the ventilation system. And unlike current heating and ventilation systems, where if a portion of a system went down for whatever reason, they had a broken part and a tenth of your system went down, the other nine tenths would pick up and fill in, if you will, for that system. It's happened at the high school, it's happened in, in buildings that we've all been in on a regular basis that have heating and ventilation systems that aren't 50 years old. The way it's set up at the middle school was each of those 11 units are responsible for one section of the building. So if anything breaks and they do break, there is no ventilation, there is no heating in that area. It was three years ago, we had a super cold winter and talk about losing sleep. That's the system was breaking what seemed like every day. We had students and staff with coats on on a daily basis. Uh, in some parts of the building, they were just fine, but they'd go into another and it literally had no heating and ventilation. Um, it's incredibly inefficient, obviously, and it's very costly to maintain. They don't make the parts that go into those 50 year old that 50 year old system with the 11 units. Uh, so we have to have the parts made for us when, when they do need to be replaced. So what we did is we pulled out and those, the pieces of the train audit and their report that went to this. So that would be, reckon, the recommendation would be that we replace or look into replacing the heating and ventilation system that upgrades our filtration significantly at school, at that school, introduces air conditioning into this, one of our oldest facilities. Uh, we would also seal up the building envelope. Uh, that's a fairly minimal cost, but it seems like the right thing to do if you're gonna put the resources into getting AC and new ventilation and heating, sealing up the envelope to make it as efficient as possible makes sense. And we would add new ventilation controls, obviously to be in line with the new system. Uh, but again, that core boiler system would not need to be replaced. If we were to move forward with this, we'd be looking at a total project of 1,968,000. 1, the way it would work in a general sense is we would pay that over 20 years with an annual payment of $127,749. We would have a guaranteed energy savings that grows every year because they can predict that there's going to be an annual and gradual increase in the cost of utilities. So that guaranteed energy savings would be 20, 28,000 in year one and go up to 49,000 in year 20. Um, that payment is still 127,749. Um, 
with the guaranteed energy savings, when we factor that in, there are a number of ways we could do that, but we are going to be paying less no matter what in terms of energy um, at that building. So if you take that energy out, we're looking at 77,000 to 112,000 a year for 20 years, which um, to me seems obviously a much, much more doable than a $9 million project. And again, it addresses, um, I guess what's becoming a theme, but facility wise, what keeps me up at night is the heating and ventilation at Grafton Middle School. In terms of source of funding, it could be, we, it, there would be, and it wouldn't be just us, it would be a CIPC, the new town administrator, uh, board of selectmen if we, or uh, board of selectmen if we did, uh, select board, sorry, if we did move forward. Um, there could be dedicated capital funding of a hundred, we could figure out a few different ways, but around a hundred thousand a year that could go to pay off that 20 year bond. Um, we could take some of the monies allocated to the school department for capital needs. Um, that wouldn't be obviously my first choice because I'd love to have that typical 250,000 to be able to work on other components of our very long facility need list, but it could be done. Um, and then we could offer to have the, the backstop be that, and it has never happened to the best of my knowledge, but if any year, if in any year the town would not be able to provide for the capital funding, the school department, so if we got in a real jam townwide in a year and didn't have capital monies, which would be horrible, we could for one year utilize revolving funds to cover the cost of that debt payment. So it's it's still a lot of money. It's a hundred. 20,000 around, you know, around there. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I, I think this would be uh, very, a, a very wise investment. Um, there's just no way that these 11 units that aren't working now are going to miraculously, you know, start working better or become more efficient or they, it's just not going to happen. Uh, one way or the other, we're going to have to address this need and, uh, both Anita and I feel like uh, it's our job to, to put this option, obviously, first and foremost, before the school committee. And I think, yep, that's all I have on, on that and can take any questions you have. And um, Liz? So what are, what are you looking for from us tonight? Is it just a, you know, and providing answers to questions and just a general consensus as to whether um, or it doesn't it's no pressure on tonight i mean we could wait till the 26 but we'd have to move if the we don't would need a vote but if the if it was generally this sounds like a good idea okay we would move forward um i would recommend that we would reach out to cipc and get you know talk to them about it when we last talked to them we were talking about a very broad scope of projects um, get advice from them. We have to figure out the timing with, obviously we have a temporary TA in place. We do have, I believe the, the new TA is coming on board, let's say early March. Um, but we'd have to not really rush, but this isn't something that we could, if we were hoping to move forward and have it approved, say at Maytown meeting, a lot of work would need to go into it. So in a very general sense, um, I think either the green light to at least move forward in its pursuit, or if for any reason, and that's fine, this just doesn't seem like the time to do it, or the school committee doesn't have an appetite for it, we would obviously just stop the pursuit and focus on other areas. Yeah, no, I, um, I think this has been, even before I was on school committee, this was on my radar and I watched the budget procedures and the things that were being considered um, as they went through the select board and, and through town meeting for years. And this has been up there and I've heard about the problems anecdotally and I've heard, uh, heard a lot of stories about this system in the middle school. So I think it is time we need this and um, talk about a, a time to make sure that the kids have good ventilation in their schools. I mean, I know we wouldn't be, have it fixed um, right now, but you know, this obviously brought the 
um, concern to the forefront of, of our attention. And um, so I, I'd be, I'd definitely be in favor of uh, pushing uh, this through and putting it back in front of the committees. Yeah, I'm 100% in favor of this uh, for many of the reasons Liz mentioned also. Um, this is every child that goes through and stays within our district hits this building. Uh, so it does impact a large amount of our students. Um, so it's it's a good investment in money as opposed to just focusing on one school, not that we wouldn't if it was needed. Um, and same with Liz, I've certainly heard anecdotally about how cold some of the rooms are um, and I can't imagine what that's like to teach and learn um, every day like that. Um, and I know we have, you know, I'm disappointed. I was excited about the original scope of the train project. Um, we do have, it seems like a creative way, but perhaps there's another way in the future when I listen to the town, new town administrator uh, interviews. Um, I think Evan spoke a lot about um, these kind of projects as well. So hopefully maybe with our new, uh, the capital uh, CIPC and um, with the new town administrator, we can think creatively down the road on how to tackle because we do have still a lot of capital projects. So um, I do agree that it's a lot of money to ask for um, right now for the bond. Um, and I think that this recommendation from you and Anita is a great start and I'm really in favor of it. Okay. We so. will we'll move forward and we'll bring it back to you um, just for an update at the very least on the 26th. Okay. All right. And in the meantime, if people, once they digest, have more questions, they can reach out to Jay between now and then uh, as well. Yep. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely would also want to kind of go back to CIBC since we gave them so much information that now we're changing. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Yep. Amy, did you have no? Call on me later for my for my committee report. Okay, all right. I mean, you can do it now if it's appropriate. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we have a lot more to go through. So, what's next? Uh, the calendar. The calendar. I will say I have been looking forward to getting back to some normalcy and stressing over the calendar, which in the past used to keep me up at night. Now it doesn't because. Yeah, th this one, it's even so much. creating the draft fell together much more easily than it has in the past. Um, so what I'm going to put before you, and I've already shared with you, is just a foundational draft. Uh, we'll take your feedback that's going to be anything that you give me for feedback tonight or in the coming days, we'll incorporate that um, and then bring it back to the school committee for consideration and hopefully a vote on the 26th. So when we create that foundational draft, we look at obviously we've got to have 180 school days with the five early release. Uh, we do the one full day prior to the start of the school year for professional development. Um, one day for parent conferences. I kept three traditional breaks and checked with uh, Candy Lavalley, and we'd have no major state or federal elections to deal with in the coming year. Um, so with that, we. I guess I take responsibility. I put together the, the basic calendar as a draft. Uh, here it is. I know you've had a little time. Uh, I shared it with this, the committee, I believe, last week. Um, and I can take any feedback. I can make any changes that, that you like and then bring it back for a, a, a final approval. Once it's in that final state, I'll have that back page ready. Um, you know, with open houses, all, all that good stuff. It looks so boring. Oh, Ben, um, oh, Amy, do you want to go first? Or was that your comment? I, I was saying it looks so boring and dull compared to this year's calendar, um, which is a good thing. But I did just now notice that channel 10 is not in the box on the lower right. NBC 10, sorry. It's quite all right. That I can add. All right, Jen. Um, I mentioned this earlier to Jay, but it was, I don't like, I, I don't, um, I was wondering if we would think about moving the first day of school to the 31st, because I um, I think teachers prefer not to come back on the Friday before. 
like give them a full last week of summer break so they don't have to come back on the 27th and teachers go back, have the teachers come in on the 30th and then the first day on the 31st was my suggestion. Um, just because I know people take vacations whenever they can and it's just, no one wants to cut short if they don't have to. So my suggestion, so whether we move it another day somewhere in the year or at the end of the year, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I actually kind of like that too, Jen, just because I think Monday is a tough day to go back. It is a three-day week already, though, because I think we have that Friday off, but I think we used to do that kind of three, four, five kind of ease in, and um, that brings the open door, that would move the open door day, yeah, to the Monday, right? Or, yeah, I, li I like that idea, but where is the last day? It's, yeah, the, the key is where do you put the extra day if, if that's the concern? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the 15th is still early for June instead of June 14th, June 15th. But um, I know in my district where I teach, we on December 23rd, we go to school. We have a half day on the 23rd. I don't know how that works with time on learning. And I'm, I'm sure maybe people like to have the 23rd off, but that was where I was thinking you could add an extra day. But that's yeah. just, that's, I don't really know. Or the 15th. I don't know. I'd prefer to put it at the end. I don't think the fifteenth is that late either. I would. I would do the same if we were gonna. I mean, I don't care. I think people are gonna be so happy and excited to go back to school that like, this is gonna be amazing. So I, I don't have strong feelings either way. I, if we were gonna move it, I'd want to put the fifteenth at the end. But I also know that teachers don't like going late because it gets it gets hot, and that's assuming we have no snow days, which that's a silly assumption. Um, so, but I, I, I'm not going to put up a fight either way. If the worry is, if the worry, and I might be not, not hearing it correctly, but if the worry is the staff, I could ask the staff, basically, would you prefer to come back on that Friday or would you like to extend a day? That works for, I mean, on my, that works for me because it seems like the concern was a staff issue and I don't want to make assumptions. Well, and, and I'm not, it, only if it is a staff issue, I, I have no problem asking and I, I don't think they're going to have a trouble. It might be 50-50, but. No, I think that'd be, um, it'd be nice to ask them and just okay. see where they feel. Okay. Maybe give them like three different scenarios. I don't know. I know in my district we vote on our, the teachers get do a quick vote. Not that we get the any say, but at least it's. Well, it sounds like if the if the committee really, I don't want to say doesn't care. I mean, you're you're talking about making the move on behalf of the teachers. See what they want to do in terms of that one variable. That's easy. I will say I'm not in favor of the 23rd. Um, hopefully, people are going to be back to normal and possibly can travel again for the holidays and. I'd rather not go through four days okay. in December. <laughs> All right, uh, I will ask them. Uh, is there anything else that jumps out to, to anybody in terms of things that need to be adjusted? I had a question. Like, Amy, did you have something or no? Okay. Um, I just wondered, and I noticed in previous calendars, we've done the same thing, but I've never had the chance to ask before it's prepared. Um, the professional development days always seem to be in the middle of the week. Is is there a reason that that's preferred over a Friday? No, it doesn't matter to myself, Thanks. Tracy, or Kristen. Yes, we purposely put them on Wednesdays because they were talking about how Wednesday had, like, Amy, go, because I can't remember the reason. Um, because oh, I know there was a reason. On Fridays just are not as productive. The teachers are tired. It's a time when they should be able to focus on their professional development. And if you put it at the end of the week when they're more tired, it's just not as productive. So if we're going to give the kids the half day, let's make the best use of the time and do it in the middle of the week. I like that it's consistent. I think for a long time we had a problem with it not being consistent. But in recent years, it's always been Wednesdays, one a month, easier to plan for. Some districts do it every Wednesday. Like I've actually seen that, and I can't even imagine a half day every Wednesday for professional development. 
Well, like, we have a half day now every week this year on a Friday. Yeah, so yeah. we did make a change to Friday and yeah. we talked about that being not that it was a productive thing for teachers. So. Well, that was my recollection of the discussion. Yeah. Asked... Yeah. Now that you're saying it, I think I think it's right. But I was the big one for the Fridays this year because I actually like it on Fridays. <laughs> I know what it was. It, the Fridays work this year because we did it in the middle of the year. It, it wasn't something we, the parents could plan for ahead of time. So it made more sense to just go ahead, put it on the Friday, make it easier. Because mid midweek, all of a sudden was going to be a problem. Oh my gosh, they kill us. So. Oh, I love that we're just having lots of discussion over the calendar. This is the most normal I've felt. <laughs> Any other questions about the calendar? So it sounds like, Jay, you're going to survey the teachers. You'll come back with a, maybe a recommendation of starting school one day later and going one day later or changing it or keeping it the same, depending on what comes from back from the teachers. Is That's that right. correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And you'll add channel 10. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for putting that together. I know I already started getting calendar questions. Um, so. Welcome back to a little bit of normalcy, I guess. And future agenda schedule planning. So we will bring back the uh, ECM next week and we'll bring back the calendar. Do we have the middle school coming? We do. Yep, they're, they're on the schedule. Um, and we're going to have a, an update on where we stand with the equity audit. Oh, great. That's terrific news. All right. Um, and I think we'll probably have more budget. So I'd like to try to keep that because this is also, this is one of our lengthier meetings tonight and we still have um, the budget to get through. So unless there's anything else urgent you guys want to hear about, we can keep it there. Okay, thank you. Um, approval of minutes from December 8th, Amy. All right, I just wanted to go back to um, future agenda planning. Sorry. Um, February 23rd looks pretty blank. If I remember, I was looking at the file in the drive and it looks like there's like nothing scheduled for February 23rd. And I didn't know if we could have a special education update around that time. That's three meetings from now. Sure. And what kind of special ed update? Well, like you? Bob and Nicole come in and tell us how the special ed kids are doing, how the, you know, how professional development's going with the paras. Because we had asked for a follow up earlier in the year, as opposed to just having them in once. Okay. I just wanted some guidance. <laughs> That's all. Because <laughs> it's a big topic. All right. Anything else? All right. Um, approval minutes. I make a motion um, to approve the minutes from December 8th, 2020 as written. Second. Motion minutes seconded. Do we have any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. Jennifer Conley. Jennifer Connolly, aye. Amy Marr. Amy Marr, aye. Liz Spinney. Aye. Rahul Rifke. Aye. Laura Often, aye. Motion carried 5-0. Um, we have a warrant as well. Oh no, sorry, I missed, I missed the budget. I'm gonna turn it over to Jay and Anita for um, a look at our 22 budget. All right. Oh, and it is getting late. Um, we usually, Annabelle and James, when we go to nine, when we're in person, if you guys wanna leave, but before you go, do you have any updates for us or? You're certainly welcome to stay, but I don't want to keep you past nine. Um, so it's a school night. I don't have any updates. Annabelle? Yeah, I have nothing either, I don't think. <laughs> well, it sounds like you guys did great work from Page of the Grafton News, the Student Council on the food donation um, for all your work 
where all the students work uh, during Spirit Week. So thanks for that. Looks like there's a lot going on um, at the school. So keep it up and thank you both. Thank you. All right, and again, you are welcome to stay, but I don't wanna keep you. So feel free to leave as well. Thank you. All right, good night. All right, Jay, sorry for that. No, no nothing, I'm glad you did. Um, all right, the Grafton public school budget. To this point, there has been um, almost nothing that's like traditionally normal in terms of building this budget. Um, back in a few months ago, I met with the town administrator, or the temporary town administrator received a budget figure for FY22. That figure was based on of no fault of anybody's like pure speculation about what would happen in terms of funding for even FY21, never mind FY22 in terms of chapter 70 money, monies received, other monies received by the town. So it's fraught with speculation, uh, the likes of which we've definitely never seen in the past 10 years, I would argue most likely in the, the history of Grafton Public Schools. Uh, again, it, nobody's fault. So the temporary town administrator basically looked at the, the pie that was assumed or uh, predicted to be available and broke it up 60-40 with um, the schools getting a defined share of that. With that, again, there were many, many assumptions made and I'm gonna to speak to that. So instead of due to the, the, not due to spending on our end, just because of anticipated lower revenues coming into the town, instead of what we are expected to get, which thanks to the override last June, would be an increase of, one point, roughly $1.7 million, or a 4.43% increase. And as you know, we had that all planned out, like pre-COVID, what we would spend that on over the next four to five years. The anticipated um, budget that we're right now scheduled to receive is built on that increase of 1.1 million. So instead of 1.7, it's 1.1 million, which would be an increase of 2.9%. That difference is $585,448. So I'm gonna to speak to it with Anita, but we're going to need, based on that speculative number, and that number could change, it could get better, it could get worse, but right now, the, that number would indicate that we're gonna spend less than we anticipated. We don't have to go to what we currently have and, and reduce by 585,000. We do need to reduce by almost 600,000 what we expected to be able to spend post override. So making those reductions is gonna be at this point very vague. We can't have a lot of specificity with so many unknowns. We obviously don't know how things are going to play out in time, terms of timing with COVID-19. Um, we don't have any major concerns right now in terms of enrollment. Um, staffing needs, that, that's a, a big one. We've already, when we talked about 2-6, we were talking about social emotional needs. We're certainly going to have reading, math needs. Uh, we could have needs that we don't even, we're not even aware of right now. But once we get back to some semblance of normalcy, we are definitely going to have needs from having over a year of non-traditional schooling. Um, so that, that's a huge factor. Um, tons of unknowns in terms of funding. Uh, the grants that we receive, we don't know if we're, we're hoping at best they're level funded, but they're most likely not going to be. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen with school choice. So far, we've seen almost no change. So that's fantastic. Um, the committee is going to have to revisit uh, fees. And I would assume we're gonna at the very least uh, resume the fees that we were already collecting in the coming year. But who knows if we're not, if this continues into next year, um, I'm sure that's going to have to be a discussion. That COVID-related staffing, uh, that, has, that worry has been uh, mitigated uh, because of the extension of the COVID funding through June 30th. Um, 
So as it stands now, we expect to be able to use those monies and get through the remainder of the year and basically break even. We won't have anything extra um, and that's okay. Uh, right now we don't foresee having additional PPE needs or additional tech needs. Um, so right now we're, we're, we have enough money to basically cover those costs and that's it. So when I talked about that pre-COVID FY22 budget, as you can, those who were here a year ago, we were at the beginning of last year, pre-COVID, we had mapped out if we did get an override, where we would, what we would spend those monies on for the next four to five years. We were scheduled with those monies to add three additional positions in FY22. Um, that in, it included contractual increases across all of our bargain units. Um, we didn't believe that we would need to add any additional paraprofessionals. And we would have your typical expense increases of 334,000. So transportation costs, technology contracts, therapeutic services, maintenance costs and contracts, capital and tuition. So fairly standard. The biggest thing that jumps out is the three additional positions that obviously we were in terms of improvement and strengthening what we do, those are critical. So that was pre-COVID. Now with COVID, we have at the very least assumptions that we're going to make. We're going to assume that chapter 70 is level funded, um, that we are going off the assumption that we're going to have that reduction in town funding and our corresponding decrease. No additional COVID monies, I mean, that, that would be a, just a tremendous blessing. But as of right now, we don't expect additional monies that aren't on the radar to become a reality. Um, I mentioned the federal grant amounts. We're hoping that we can just stay level. We probably won't, um, but we'll see. We're going to have a reduced need for technology hardware purchasing next year because we've been able to purchase so much hardware with the COVID monies this year. That's a, a huge plus for us. Um, we're going with the assumption in building this budget that we're not going to have the spacing restrictions of three feet minimum next year that we'd be back to more or less a normal year in 21-22. Pure, purely speculation, but that's our assumption. Um, we're, we're assuming that we're not going to need any significant programming or space changes for the coming year. We won't be carrying over in this budget any of the COVID-related positions that we've brought on board. And we're going to assume that we've we're able to maintain stable special education out of district rates. Again, right now, things are looking very good. We haven't been seeing a, a large increase by any means. Um, so things are looking good, but that certainly could change. So in a very simple way, pre-COVID, we were expecting the 1.7. We're now anticipating an increase of 1.1. So we've got to modify that request by 586,000. In terms of the preliminary reductions, the thinking would be we're going to need $300,000 less than anticipated in terms of technology hardware. We would take out two of the three new teaching positions. We would reduce our district capital expenditures for usually the smaller projects by $35,000 general reduction in of a, a small percentage uh, district-wide in terms of supplies, that would come out to be $10,000. SRO funding, so we, we, the school resource officer, you may recall we were able through a, a grant that was obtained by the uh, police chief, secure SRO funding for three years. The last year, this past year, that grant expired and we took on the the full salary for that um, of 55,000 and have covered that. Going forward, if we have to reduce by almost 600,000, um, we're certainly not gonna be able to continue that, that funding um, in the coming year. That could be picked up by the police potentially, although they're gonna be faced with the same challenges or on the town-wide level. Um, there's also the possibility of coming, if we can't secure any funding for that, maybe having it be a dedicated 
uh, like part-time for the schools as opposed to full-time. And then finally, staffing reductions. Um, we would have to reduce staffing by $70,000. We would ideally continue our work with our, um, the work we were doing with paraprofessional positions, trying to uh, slowly but thoughtfully reduce and combine um, positions, again, thoughtfully to meet all student needs uh, in a more staffing efficient manner. Um, and in the past couple of years, we've been able to do that without actually reducing people, but unfilled positions. Um, we just don't know at this point if that's, if we're gonna be able to do that. We're gonna have to, when the dust settles, if you will, and we almost come out of this you know, period of COVID and are going back to schools, that's when we're gonna know very well what, what our needs are. And then obviously we're gonna to have to come up with a plan to um, address those needs in a general sense, but also on an individual student basis. In terms of variables, um, I feel like I've talked to you guys about this a hundred times, but we've got the town budget and state funding. If that changes to the good or to the bad, that's gonna impact how much funding we have. Those entitlement grants that I've talked about um, from the federal government, they bring in about $900,000 a year for us. So if those take a significant hit, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, special education costs, again, right now, in terms of where things stand, we're in a very stable place, but that could change. Uh, staffing needs I've talked about and the, the costs associated with those needs. Um, again, the overall town budget, and I've mentioned the entitlement grants now twice, but it's pretty important. Um, so with that, that's our summary. We have put together a budget book. Again, we've now this is the 10th budget book we've put together. We've never put one together like this, where it's just fraught with, with variables and unknowns. Um, but we did the best we could to put forward our, our best thinking. As I've mentioned numerous times, I expect this budget book to develop on a almost daily basis, but certainly when we go to you every other week, there's gonna be an updated, more developed book. Um, so we're going off of that number of 39.4 million. The school, committee, me, the school committee on the 26th will be asked to vote to approve the preliminary FY2 budget. And in doing so, I just wanna make it clear that the school committee is not voting for all of the all of the lines that make up that budget and the different numbers for transportation, staffing, et cetera, what you guys are voting on is that bottom line number. Um, and again, that may change. And we may come back to you as we have in the past, uh, we've come back to you this year, probably more than ever. Um, as that number develops, I would expect that we're going to be asking the school committee to reconsider um, or consider the new number, hopefully a larger one, and vote on that. We do have to have a budget hearing prior to the school committee's vote, so I'd recommend that we hold a budget hearing 15 minutes before the next regularly scheduled meeting on the 26th. Anita and I will go through this basic, you know, uh, some semblance of, of the same presentation, and then during the regular meeting, ask the committee to vote on that bottom line number. And with that, I can take any questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. Amy. Yeah, I had a question about school choice, Jay, because um, I didn't see that on your list of assumptions. Are we, are we where we were last year with that? And do you anticipate a change? Yeah, um, hopefully I didn't cover all the assumptions here. On page two is a list of assumptions. I'm hoping I put school choice remains, we remain open to it and it remains stable. Uh, we've had no change in school choice in terms of some districts have seen big changes. Um, I say we were a district that was doing, that say we were doing all remote, the kids coming to us through school choice may want to then leave us actually and go to a district that has hybrid, but that didn't happen to us in any way. We haven't lost any students. Uh, we've actually seen, like last year, I thought it was kind of crazy how many phone calls we were getting. 
this year has doubled that um, with people looking to um, to get on the, the in, in school choice in Grafton, get in the lottery, et cetera. So I think we'll see um, even higher numbers this year. Liz? Okay. So I, I understand where, the, and I know, understand the budget is just preliminary and understand where this number originally came from. And um, I, I did watch the, the select board meeting after our school committee meeting to get a better idea of the conversation that you had with, with the temporary TA Carter um, about that number. And I would be against moving forward with this 60-40 split, A, because I think it's, com I, I, it's completely, it's, and not completely, it's largely ambiguous sort of how, why he came up with this number and just, you know, said, okay, so school, you, you get 60% of the budget. It did not also, it also didn't seem to have the support of the members of the select board. They seemed very um, uh, critical of that method from him. Um, and what we're getting soon, um, hopefully if contract negotiations uh, go as, as planned, if they go well, is a, a TA who I think is going to be very school friendly. And I, I think of, uh, you know, it'll have sort of a different strategy. And um, I think we should go to them and say, this is what we need. And, you know, I, I, it's 0.8% about of our town's budget that we, the Delta in this, um, assuming of, I think it's usually like what, 68 million a year, something like that, but it's a very small, portion of our yearly budget that that makes up that difference and we'll, we just passed an override and we're talking about not hiring people next year uh i don't want to hear that <laughs> i don't want to hear that i don't want to i don't want us to do that and and i'd rather us go into this saying you know it's a, it, it is a relatively small difference us go into it saying this is what we need we're all you know we're almost there um and you know, it was good. And start from there. Yeah, sorry, Ned. I've oh, just, I yeah. So Liz, I had um, already had the same exact thoughts as you, um, and I was going to recommend tonight that we try to get in front of the select board maybe next week if we could get on their agenda next Tuesday, which would move our policy meeting. But um, and talk with them. I think I always like to just. Uh, I understand the craziness of this budget. So I want to be completely, you know, open about this. We can't control some of the the state, but they didn't, the select board didn't seem like they were completely on board. Carter's doing a great job, but he's only temporary. It's not his budget. My concern also would be we're getting be set back. And then when we come the next year, it's going to be an even bigger increase and it's going to be a little confusing. Um, I always like to at least advocate for what we need. Um, it's our job, I think so, and at least talk about it in a in a in a discussion, and we'll see what people think. And if we have to make reductions, we'll make reductions. But I want to at least try. And and I don't know where what's going on on the other side of town, and we always have to make difficult choices. So my recommendation, um, I don't know how much further we go, is it, is that we sit down with at least the select board, possibly FinCom, as soon as possible. And just have a discussion, which was something we all along wanted to do and, and be more open about our budgets. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, and then I'm sorry, I know we have a lot, I hate jumping in early, but I just didn't want it to go too far, which that's what I was going to recommend. So I agree with you. If I could just jump, I agree with you. I would probably recommend, I know we're kind of pushing up against the clock here, but well, I guess Carter, so he has to have a budget probably before. He does, yeah. Right. So I was going to recommend waiting until um, Mr. Bassard is is in place, but I guess that'd be too late, wouldn't it? I think we need to at least start. I'd like the select board to know how we think, too, and and at least just 
open the conversation and talk. And again, like this isn't like a we have to go in and like I just want to talk about you know where we are, what we promised during the override, what we want to talk about, and and just have a great conversation, which is something again we've all been saying in the different committees that we want to work more closely together and and just kind of share our, our experiences. One of my concerns about the variables is we don't really, you know, Liz, you asked, um, or Nora, you know, have you seen more anxiety in kids? And they all said, yes, like, we don't know exactly where kids are gonna be, where they're gonna be when they come back full time. I think we've done a phenomenal job, um, but we don't know what people are gonna need just to kind of move them forward and, and move them to the next step. So we might be needing more than we don't anticipate. So um, I think we should at least start it. We can always meet again, but at least just start these conversations and I'll just read, and it takes so long. I'll just reach out to Peter after this meeting and see how quickly we can get on the agenda. Um, if that's okay with you guys. And we can still talk, Jay. I know this is such, you guys, first of all, did a great job. You and Anita, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you just laying it out so uh, succinctly. And, uh, but that, that's, $600,000 is a little concerning to me without us really having a discussion. I just want to discuss it. Sorry. To me, Laura, if you'd like to set that up. Yeah, be happy to. I love setting it up. I agree. I, I would support that. Rahul? Yeah, I agree with both of you. The thing is, uh, we advocated for the override. And when parents come to know that we are putting in 600,000 less, it wouldn't go down well with them probably. The, the second thing I wanted to ask Jay, uh, is the, the salary of our teachers comparable with the districts in the neighborhood? Um, that's more complex than a, a yes, no. It depends on where they, they stand on. I can get you that information the last time. I mean, typically with any district when they go through uh, negotiations, we have to put together a lot of that data. So I can share that. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's tough to answer is it depends on where you stand. If you're more experienced, if you're new, if you've got a master's, if you have a bachelor's, um, we generally are, I'll say, I'm gonna say in the middle and even when we say, with our neighbors, it really depends. If is that Westboro? Is it a less affluent neighbor? You can kind of cherry pick, or some people can. Um, so I can get that data, but we, I, I'd certainly want to, to the best of our ability, um, compensate all of our staff as well as we can. Okay. When I talk about my neighbors, I specifically mean like, let's say Hopkinton and Shrewsbury, Westboro or Northbridge, just the neighbors touching our boundaries. Yep, so those that you mentioned, we'd be generally um, behind. I mean, we're not like dead last by any means, but we're, we're not gonna be number one in, in that comparison, no way. Um, so without going broke, we obviously want to compensate our, our staff to be as competitive as possible. And Rahul, we are up for contract negotiation on all our bargaining units um, this year. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, I read that in the. Yeah, and I, so I think everybody's. We'll have to double check on who's on what because I can't remember. Um, but that'll start soon, and that's a big piece of an unknown Perfect. that we can't predict. Sounds good. Anybody else? I kind of feel like I. I that's why I hate jumping in, but I just wanted to, I didn't want to wait till the end on that because Liz was like she was reading my mind. Um, any other thoughts about the budget or questions? Um, Amy? Amy? If we're going to go to school, school committee, we are the school <laughs> committee. If we're going to go to select board next week. Um, do we still want to have the hearing on the 26th or do we want to push it out? Because that that's going to be a, a bigger deal than we're thinking because it's going to have to allow public participation. If I'm, it's a public hearing, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I actually gonna. 
Um, it, you can certainly push it out. The only reason that we're, we do it in this time frame is it's dictated by the charter. We're actually behind. I think it was supposed to, it's typically supposed to be done in the beginning of January. Every year, we're just not ready and there's no real huge rush. I mean, there aren't charter police out there. And every year the town administrator says, you know, we can go into late January, early February, as long as I would assume, as long as we're transparent, which we are with select board, given everything going on, temporary TA, et cetera, I, I don't think it's an, an issue whatsoever. Okay. And we can always look at things and, and move it. And I was gonna recommend we at least do a half hour, Jay. Um, rather than 15 minutes. Um, but last year was the only time ever I've had anybody ever speak at the public hearing, but yeah, people are way more involved and uh, knowledgeable this time. So I um, wanna give people the opportunity. But that I think that's something we can publicize and we can uh, uh, reassess over the next week. Um, any other, well, and Jay, I, I'm, Sure, it will be. So your preliminary budget, is that online for people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll put it in, uh, I mean, it's accessible with the link to this meeting, the whole dry folders accessible okay. within there. Um, we'll also put it under the finance page. I wanted to run it by you guys first officially, uh, but it will go up there tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Liz, oh, you just, okay. And Anita, thank you. Great job, your first time out. Um, yeah, I, I did all the talking and hogged the, the spot. Mm -hmm. Anita's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, did you have anything you wanted to add, Anita? I don't, Jay did a wonderful job. Okay, good. <laughs> she knows the right thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just go. <laughs> Just keep moving ahead. Any other questions about the budget for now? We obviously have a lot more of time to discuss it. I'll move as soon as, and again, I don't even know if they wanna have us next Tuesday. So I'll talk to Peter and we'll, I guess, send out the doodle and see how many people can come and, and do the best we can. Um, I yeah. would like to also invite finance committee, just I value their input. Um, that makes it a little more challenging, but I'll do what I did last time. And if you can make it, you can make it majority rules kind of thing. And I am going to try to see if we can, because I don't think it's going to be a long discussion either. Like we don't not, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It's just communication. So I'll see if we can get on the next season. Okay. But I, I have no, I have no idea what's on their agenda. So Amy, I think you're more in touch with that than, than I am. <laughs> I know about the meeting sometimes because of you, not because of my oh, family okay. member that's on the select. <laughs> yeah, I only see them when they pop up on the calendar on the town site. So I assume they're meeting next Tuesday. I, yeah. I have no inside information at this time. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm like, oh, Amy said you have a meeting. So anyway, we're moving on. Um, warrant. We have two warrants tonight. Um, so I move the school committee approve warrant number 26, dated December 24th, 2020, in the amount of $1,024. Wait, sorry. One million twenty four thousand six hundred and nine dollars and sixty cents. Okay, motion made and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Jennifer Connolly. Jennifer Connolly, aye. Amy Marr. Amy Marr, aye. Elizabeth Spinney. Aye. Rahul Rati. Rahul Rati, aye. Laura Austin, I motion carries five zero. Um, I move the committee approve warrant number 29 dated January 11th, 2021 in the amount of $811,986 and 33 cents. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Just checking is, and I don't have it right open right in front of me. Is that date right? Because on our agenda, yeah, is it, date? it is okay. No, I mean it shouldn't be a, a June, January fourteenth because that's in two days from now. No, I said January eleventh. You okay. said Jan That's the date on the warrant. Okay. Okay. I'll copy oh, it's the date. On, okay, but the what's the one on the agenda? Just making sure that uh, 
there was no no i was stressed about making sure i didn't say 2020 on that which is why i messed up the amount on the last time oh. <laughs> Trustful, those numbers are so big to say it was our first one over a million that's huge who said those numbers i could never write that check if i had to i, I mean i could write it, it but it would bounce anyway we have a motion in a second um take a roll call vote jennifer Connolly. jennifer Connolly, i amy mark Amy Mar, aye. Liz Spinney, aye. Rahul T, aye. Laura Austin, aye. All right, motion carries 5 0. Thank goodness we are almost finished because obviously I am getting a little punchy. Um, member reports. Oh, Amy, I'm calling you first because you were oh, excited. I was going to let Liz go first because she has bigger news, but she um, does have bigger news. I'm unmuted, so I'll go. Um, the CIPC has met once. We're going to meet again this week. Um, we're working on the five year plan. Um, for the schools, that basically just means that I'm copying a bunch of stuff uh, from everything Jay has given me into a different spreadsheet. Um, and then the committee is going to meet and go over that on Thursday. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the train thing. So as of right now, there's nothing in there at all about it. I just want everybody to know that that's not on the radar. Um, and I don't know what the impact is going to be on the capital items that CIPC has already recommended to the TA for fiscal year 22, if we decide to go that route, um, how much how much of those actually will get funded and how much will move into the five-year plan after that decision is made. So it's it's we're doing the work we can do, but it is still very up in the air. Okay, thank you, Liz. Yeah, so the TA screening committee uh, interviewed some wonderful candidates and we put we selected three out of the ones that we interviewed and recommended those to the select board. Um, they interviewed those three and um, and voted to put forth Evan Broussard, who's from he's a TA was a TA from Monson and um, I can't say enough great things about this uh, candidate. Um, I think he's going to be great. He's going to be great for the schools. Um, I really liked him. Jay, you might get a uh, dinner invite. I don't, I don't want to <laughs> commit him to anything, but um, I, he told a story about um, how he likes to take uh, school superintendents out to dinner to get to know them. So I thought that was great. Um, what about school committee chairs? Yeah, committee members. I like to go out to dinner. I love dinner. It's going to be a great addition to the town, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know him better and and, um, and seeing what he has to add to, to Grafton. I think I'm really excited to, to see him get to work. Hopefully. I think it's not finalized. He's still, you know, they have to work through contract negotiations and, and all that. Um, but um, who wouldn't who wouldn't say yes to Grafton? It's, it's a wonderful town. Um, so very exciting. Yeah, thank you so much in that committee. Um, I watched the interviews and I definitely was rooting for Evan also. Um, I can't wait to meet him and, and work with him. Um, but I mean, all three were great, were great candidates. So well done. I know that was a lot of work and thank you, Liz. I think you represented the school committee well and I'm glad you had the opportunity to do that. And you guys did great work. It seemed like it was a really great committee um, yeah. from what I heard. It was great. It was fun. And um, <laughs> what? <laughs> did a great job leading the committee. And um, it was, you know, a lot of different opinions in the room, but, uh, you know, it was really helpful because everyone had you know, different insight and experience that they brought into the committee and it helped us um, get to a great, uh, to, to find a couple of great candidates. And actually there were so many, I mean, the pool was great, but we, we started with, um, I think it was 30 candidates that we got resumes for and we reviewed those, called those down to um, eight candidates that we then interviewed and, um, and so it was hard to, to select those top three, but Evan definitely stood out. He was, he was my favorite from 
um, the beginning. So I'm really glad that, that he ended up getting the offer or getting the, the nod from the select board. And can't wait to, to see what he has to do for graphics. Mm -hmm. So I had a question. One of the things that your committee did in the very beginning was you surveyed the community mm -hmm. to find out kind of what does Grafton want? Is that information available anywhere or are you guys just keeping that? It, it's available in blinded format, but yeah, um, that I'm trying to think of where that was made available. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I can, you know, I can, um, get back to you on that. <laughs> I'm just curious I, to know kind of what direct, like if there was like good consensus among the townspeople or it was all over the place. Like, I just wanted to get a feel for, you know, what people want. I think it would help advise us on budgeting as a town and, you know, even CIPC. Would help yeah. You to know. We, we looked at that in one of our meetings, um, which was public and definitely people definitely wanted someone who um, was, you know, financially minded, someone who would would help um, with economic development in town and um, someone who would um, be able to bring people together and facilitate um, good um, workings within the municipal center. Um, but there were definitely, yeah, it, it was somewhat of a consensus. There were some interesting outliers who <laughs> had some interesting things to say too. So that was, um, you know, good to hear everyone's opinion. I think we got about a hundred responses um, from people around town. So um, I, I can get back to you. I haven't looked at that in a while, so I can get back to you and provide more information on, on that and what the responses were, but. Cool, well, I'm just personally curious and really, I really appreciate that the committee did that. Yeah, it was, it was, what was that? I'm disappointed with the response rate, but oh. it's important to ask. Yeah, I mean, we tried to advertise this. We had a, a Google form and we tried to advertise it in many different places. Um, we, we let people know about it through the senior center. We let people know about it online and in as many places as we could. We also had kind of a quick turnaround time though. We didn't have a lot of time to collect responses. So, you know, it takes a while, especially now to get word out about things like that. So, you know, may not, they may not have just had time for the word to circulate um, to get a lot of people to respond, but, um, but it was helpful. I think you did a good job advertising it and it was an easy survey to take. So I don't think it was on the committee's uh, ownership to that no. less people. You know, it, I'm trying to say. <laughs> you it, did a good job. It wasn't something we had to do. It was just um, something extra. So um, I, I know in Grafton, people like to have their voices heard. So we're glad to be able to do that, facilitate that. Good. Any other member reports? No. Okay. And I don't have any official correspondence. Um, we don't need to go into executive session, so I will call for adjournment. I move to adjourn. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call vote. Jen Conley. Jen Conley, aye. Amy Marr. Aye. Liz Finney. Aye. Rahul Ortiz. I'll oh, write to you, aye. And Laura Austin, aye. All right, and thanks for the eight people that wound up hanging in with us this whole meeting. Uh, everybody have a good night and happy new year. <laughs>